Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the D and What If, with another fanfiction. This is the movie of What If Bakugo's family returns from a trip with a new family member. All credits for this video go to their respective authors. So please support the real author. Check out the link in the description for more details. Please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Every year the Bakugo family went on at least one special vacation. It had been their family tradition for as long as Katsuki could remember. This year, Katsuki, the energetic seven-year-old with the explosion quirk, had begged his parents to go camping for their family vacation, an activity the young boy had never done but always wanted to do. So instead of going on an overpriced holiday, the Bakugo family packed their bags, got in their car, and set off to the forest they had picked to camp in. But the Bakugos don't do anything half-assed. Oh, no no no. They weren't going to some nice, peaceful campsite where other people would be camping. No, they planned to hike into the forest and make their own campsite. The drive was long and by the time they finally got there, after the six-hour car journey, Katsuki had jumped out of the car and was running around the dirt parking lot as soon as they had parked. His parents took him to a nearby playground to blow off some energy while they got things ready for the hike into the forest. He didn't complain. Being stuck in his car seat for so long made him desperate to run around. And the local kids already at the playground were quick to introduce themselves, since they were curious about the blonde and wanted to know why they'd never seen him before. I'm going camping in the forest with my parents. Mom says that if I'm lucky, I can fight a bear. Katsuki exclaimed, not realizing that his mom was joking when she had said it. The other children looked at him with mild shock and horror as Katsuki shouted about camping in the forest. You gotta watch out for more than just bears in that forest. One of the slightly older kids replied. Katsuki raised a skeptical eyebrow at the taller boy. Why? I can make explosions. Nothing can beat me. The forest thing can a small girl whispered shyly as if she said it any louder. The forest thing would pop out of nowhere at any moment. Yeah, if you get lost in the woods, it'll offer to help you. But if you accept you'll never be seen again. The taller boy exclaimed, looking even more worried now. It'll grab you and drag you to its cave. Then it'll eat you alive the older kid shivered. He looked to be about eleven. That's stupid. Forest monsters don't exist. Those are just stories Katsuki crossed his arms with a huff. Did they seriously believe in these stories? They were probably made up so kids wouldn't wander into the forest. A girl with just as much anger issues and sass as Katsuki rolled her eyes and put her hands on her hips. It killed someone once. He was trying to protect a little girl and the forest thing killed him. Yeah, dude, it'll totally eat you whole the older boy snickered. Katsuki was about to protest. But his mother called him, which meant it was time to head into the forest. With a glare, Katsuki left the group of kids and ran towards his parents. He's just gonna have to find this forest thing himself. After hiking through the forest for an hour and a half, the Bakugos found a nice clearing to set up camp in. This meant that while his parents were busy, Katsuki could go look for the forest monster. So as the sun prepared to set, the young blonde ran off into the forest after telling his parents he was simply going to play. There was a path, but Katsuki didn't care. The kids he met had told him he needed to be lost for the monster to find him, so the path didn't matter. While wandering through the forest aimlessly, it had crossed his mind that this probably isn't a good idea. Not that he actually believed a monster lived in the forest. His plan was to get lost so he could possibly find it. If he didn't find it, he would just be hopelessly lost. Katsuki hopped over a tree stump then stopped walking. He already is lost at oh. With the sudden realization that getting lost in the forest at sunset on purpose wasn't a good idea, the panic set in. He turned in a circle, looking around in every direction as he tried to figure out which way the camp was. Left. Right. No. Was it straight ahead? Now was not a good time to be good at getting lost. His breath starts to quicken as the panic makes his tiny heart race inside his chest. Are you lost? Came a soft voice from the shadows of the trees. The forest was almost pitch black as the sun dipped below the horizon. Katsuki turned quickly towards the source of the voice, his eyes landing on the form of a skinny teenager, about 15 years old, wearing ragged and ripped brown pants and a black t-shirt, his pale skin smeared with dirt, with emerald eyes to match his messy green hair, a few leaves and sticks stuck in the curls of Viridian. Katsuki nodded quickly, not questioning the homeless-looking teenager who had appeared out of the trees. I'll take you back to your parents. The boy held out his hand with a crooked smile on his face. It was the most friendly smile Katsuki had ever seen. The blonde child slowly took the teenager's hand and they started walking in a direction that Katsuki had assumed was correct. What's your name? Katsuki blurted out, unable to handle the silence as they walked. Uh, the green-haired boy hesitated slightly. Izuku, you can call me Izuku. And you, I'm Katsuki Bakugo and I'm gonna be the strongest hero ever. Katsuki shouted, pumping his fist in the air as a few sparks popped from it. The enthusiasm of the young kid made Izuku's grin widen. Oh yeah, so what's that quirk you got? 
And with that, Katsuki started to ramble about his quirk to the teenager as he was led back to his parents. After what could have only been 15 minutes, Katsuki finally stopped talking and turned to look up at Izuku, curiosity sparkling in his red eyes. So what's your quirk? He asked with a slight tilt of his head. Once again, the older boy hesitated, this time longer than the last. While I actually don't have a quirk he answered, his grin getting smaller but never leaving his face. Is that why you're out here alone in the middle of the night, looking like a hobo? The kid asked with bluntness only a child could have. While staring at Izuku, waiting for an answer, Katsuki took a moment to really look at his features. The more he looked, the more Izuku didn't look right. When he smiled, Katsuki could see the odd amount of teeth the teen had and how they looked a bit sharp. He could see his emerald eyes that seemed too big, how the freckles on his cheeks seemed too perfectly placed. It was odd, but even though Katsuki was blunt, he wasn't about to be blatantly rude by asking about his appearance. It was just the lack of light playing tricks on him. Then his mother's voice caught his attention and he forgot all about the teen's odd appearance as new questions flooded his head. How did Izuku know where their camp was? He never said anything about where his family was and yet the boy had somehow known where to bring him. The puzzle pieces slowly started to fit together in Katsuki's head. Oh, shit. Katsuki turned to confront the teen, only to find that he had completely disappeared. With a frustrated grunt, Katsuki ran to his mother, both his parents smothering him with hugs upon his return. The next morning the Bakugos woke early, around 7am, to get ready for the day, they were going hiking again. All night Katsuki couldn't stop thinking about Izuku. He argued with himself and tried to deny that he thought the teen was the monster he had been warned about. But eventually, he came to the conclusion that the only way to find out the truth was to find him again. That meant getting lost. And without thinking it through fully, Katsuki ran off into the forest to get lost again. It didn't take long for Katsuki to get lost again. And it took even less time for the panic of the situation to set in. Why didn't he think things through? He ran off and got lost again without a second thought. And nobody's going to find him, forest monsters don't exist. Katsuki heard a footstep and spun around to find the source of the noise. And just like the night before, there was Izuku. The blonde took a moment to take in the teen's appearance once again. This time the light couldn't trick his eyes into seeing things that weren't there. But to Katsuki's surprise, his appearance was the same. The more he looked, the more he noticed the boy's odd appearance, just like the night before. You're the forest monster, Katsuki accused, pointing a finger at the green-haired boy. Izuku took a step back, his expression looking shocked and a bit sad. Is that what they're calling me now? He asked, and Katsuki could hear the faint sadness in his voice. I knew it. You are, Katsuki exclaimed as he ran towards Izuku and grabbed his hand. Just now noticing the teen's nails were sharp. So what's the story? He asked eagerly. A girl in town said that you killed someone. Izuku sighed softly as he started to lead Katsuki back to his campsite, where his parents would be worried sick again. He was trying to hurt a little girl. Katsuki stared. He wasn't expecting that to be the answer. Seeing the little boy's mild shock, he continued. He stole her from her own home and he was going to hurt her. I just got so angry that I lost control and I killed him. Izuku spoke quietly as he told the story. I tried changing to a more human form but they're still scared of me. And Katsuki hummed and thought as he walked alongside the boy everyone thought was a monster. Can you change to look however you want? Yes. Why? Izuku asked, sounding slightly nervous. Good, you're my dog now. I've always wanted a dog. Katsuki spoke so nonchalantly as if this was a normal conversation to have with someone. Izuku stuttered for a moment, at a loss for words, before muttering a simple, What? The people here don't like you that much, you scare them. You can pretend to be a dog and come live with me at my house. I've been asking mom to get a dog for a long time. He couldn't possibly well. Maybe having company does sound nice, he's been alone for a long, long time. As the campsite came into view, the two could hear Katsuki's parents calling his name, they sounded worried. The young boy looked up at Izuku with wide, red eyes, as if begging him to be his dog. With a stiff nod, Izuku started to change form, skin ripping and bones cracking as his once humanoid form changed to look like a stray dog. Grayish, brown fur with a few patches missing, the same green eyes, the same to many teeth. He stood as tall, or taller than Katsuki, looking like a dog of an unidentifiable breed, most closely resembling an Irish wolfhound. With a pat on the head and a wide smile, Katsuki ran to the campsite, Izuku following close behind. I'm here. Look, look, I found a dog. Katsuki exclaimed excitedly as he pointed at Izuku. He's mine now, his name is Izuku. The Bakugo parents watched, dumbfounded, as their son sat by the campfire with a stray dog that looked like it could eat him whole. As Katsuki wrapped his arms around the dog in a tight hug, his parents cringed slightly, not knowing if the dog had any diseases or not. They shared a glance for a moment, knowing what the look meant before going back to what they had been doing before. The sun was setting once again as Masaru and Mitsuki packed everything into their car, 
They noticed the mangy-looking dog staring at them, not blinking once. The longer Masaru looked at the dog, the more he noticed how weird the thing looked. Emerald green, unblinking eyes that seemed to glow. Mangy fur that seems to resemble moss, too many sharp teeth poking out of its mouth. The more he looked, the more it didn't look like a dog anymore. Mitsuki put her sleeping son in his car seat and shut the car door quietly as to not wake him up. Both parents looked at the dog who was calmly laying on the grass, watching them. Then the adults looked at each other, having a silent conversation before getting into the car and driving off without the dog. Masaru and Mitsuki watched in shock as they pulled into their driveway, seeing the same mangy dog sitting on their doorstep. They won't be able to get rid of it, will they? The parents sighed in defeat as they brought everything inside, including the strange dog. I guess they have a new member of the family now. As the years went by, Izuku never left Katsuki's side. The dog would walk him to and from school, accompany him on outings with friends, or on family vacations whenever he could. As long as dogs were allowed, Izuku was there. He wasn't always a dog, but Katsuki's parents didn't know that. Occasionally he would change to his more human form so he and Katsuki could talk. Over the years the two became best friends and somewhere along the way Katsuki had given him the nickname Deku. Katsuki had other friends but none of them were as close to him as he was with the forest thing. Izuku loved to just be around Katsuki. He's the kid's protector and his best friend, and as mean or loud as Katsuki is, he likes being around Izuku just as much. The two almost couldn't be separated. Izuku was rightfully worried when Katsuki left for the UA entrance exam. He knew how dangerous the exam could be, which made him even more proud when they found out Katsuki had passed. His kid would be going to UA. He was gonna be a hero. The night the acceptance letter came, the two spent most of the night celebrating. Katsuki was so excited to go to UA, the best hero school in the country. And Izuku was so happy that the kid he had pretty much adopted was getting closer to achieving his dreams. The first day of high school came fast and that morning, just like every morning for the past seven years, Izuku walked Katsuki to school. In his dog form, he was tall enough that his back almost reached Katsuki's waist when he was on all fours. And while nobody would mess with Katsuki because the boy already looked scary enough as is, the scary dog privileges just meant a lot of people avoided them when they walked down the street. The pair reached the gates of the school and Katsuki walked in, waving to Izuku as he went to find his class. What Katsuki didn't know is that the dog would sit, as still and unblinking as a statue, in the middle of the gate all day waiting for him. The presence of the dog catching the attention of the principal and a few teachers by the time lunch rolled around. Is that a dog? Midnight asked as she stared out the window of the staff lounge, seeing the mangy-looking mutt sitting just outside the gate. Indeed, Nedzu chirped, it's been sitting outside the gates all morning, just staring at anyone who walks by. Hound Dog looked out the window again, locking eyes with the dog, a shiver going up his spine. That thing isn't a dog. He had been sent out by the principal to try and scare the dog away but hadn't gotten closer than 10 feet before his instincts screamed at him to not go near the mud. Currently, Snipe is trying his best to get the dog's attention. He had gotten closer than Hound Dog had and is now trying every call he knows to get the dog to move but the mutt just stares at him with its green, unblinking eyes. After a solid ten minutes, Snipe gives up and heads back to the teacher's lounge where the rest of the teachers had finally joined them. No luck I assume. The rat principal looked intrigued. Snipe let out a frustrated sigh as he sat down on a free chair. The thing just stared at me. It was pretty creepy. The principal hummed and thought as he sipped his hot tea. If the creature liked staring, he'll just have to send a racer. Aizawa, since you also like staring, how about you try to get the dog to listen? The rat had phrased it like a suggestion, but the tired teacher knew it was an order. With an unamused grunt, Aizawa stood up and removed his yellow sleeping bag, then made his way to the door. The grumpy-looking hero course teacher left the building, not hesitating to stand barely three feet away from the dog. Then the staring contest began, glowing red eyes meeting glowing green as the two stared at each other. A minute passed and neither of them moved. Then two minutes. Then three. Oh, Izuku likes this human. The only other person able to handle his stare was Katsuki and Izuku knew how uncomfortable he made people besides his kid and apparently this dude. Sensing that the man is more of a cat person, instead of doing anything dog-like, Izuku stands up and rubs against the man's legs like a cat would, even though the dog is almost as tall as the man's waist. Aizawa reached down to the dog's green collar, something Izuku only wore when he went out with Katsuki, and read the tag. Name, Izuku. He read the one side then turned it over to read the other side. I'm not lost. I'm waiting for my human. A tired sigh escaped the man's lips as he patted the dog on the head, seemingly unfazed by the increasingly unsettling appearance of the dog. Look, you can wait here but don't sit in the middle of the gate. You're freaking people out. So that's why all these people have been trying to get him to leave. Oops. Izuku walked over to the gate again. This time the large dog-looking creature sat out of the way of the gate. Hopefully, they'll forgive him for freaking people out. That wasn't what he was trying to do. 
Aizawa nodded and walked back to the school. He had a class to teach. When the school day had finished, students started walking through the gates as they headed home, some giving Izuku weird looks when they noticed him, others seemed more unnerved by the strange dog that sat by the gate. Then as his favorite blonde exited the school, Izuku felt a surge of joy shoot through him as he stood and trotted over to him. He watched as Katsuki hid his smile when he saw Izuku coming his way and as he gave the dog a few pets on the head. Hey, Deku, how was your day? The blonde asked, knowing he wouldn't actually get a verbal reply from the creature, but the way Izuku pushed his head towards his hand, told him his friend had missed him. Aizawa-sensei told me about your staring contest. Katsuki snickered as they walked away from the school, and how you scared Hound Dog without actually doing anything. If Izuku was in human form, he would have laughed at the almost evil grin that spread across his kid's face. Whoa, back you go. An unfamiliar voice shouted from behind them. The two turned around to see a boy with red hair and sharp teeth, slightly shorter than Katsuki. What do you want, shitty hair? Katsuki snapped. Is this one of his classmates? It doesn't sound like Katsuki likes him very much, but Katsuki doesn't really like anyone besides Izuku. The redhead walked over to the pair, his wide smile never leaving his face even as he took in Izuku's strange appearance. Is that your dog? Is huge. The boy exclaimed as he reached out to pet him. Izuku didn't resist. Pets are great. Katsuki groaned and rolled his eyes at his loud classmate. Yeah, he's my dog he replied, noticing more of his classmates approaching them. Another blonde, this one shorter than Katsuki and the redhead, a ravenet, taller than the other three boys, and a girl with pink skin and hair, the shortest of the group. Damn, Bakugo, that's a weird looking dog, the ravenet said as he stared at the dog that now sat next to Katsuki. The other blonde looked hesitant to get close to him. Izuku could sense the slight panic coming from the teen. You dogs don't really like me. He doesn't bite, right? Izuku doesn't bite unless Katsuki is in danger. But he knew Katsuki was about to say he does, just to mess with his classmate. He didn't bite me. The redhead smiled as he scratched Izuku's ears. Just don't electrocute him, Kaminari. Izuku looked up at Katsuki, watching the annoyed expression on his face as his classmates gawked at and petted his dog. The forest thing moved away from the other students and pressed his head against Katsuki's side, hoping to calm the easily angered blonde. And it worked. He watched as Katsuki's expression changed to his normal, resting glare. And with that, the two simply left, headed home to eat and talk about what had happened that day. Izuku just hoped that Katsuki would be able to make friends with his new classmates. Why is this rat talking to me? And why is it bipedal? Izuku thought, trying to make sense of this situation. The being in front of him was rat-like, with white fur and a scar over its eye, but it spoke. Why did it speak? The forest thing had been alive for a long time, and never has he met a talking animal. Why is it wearing a suit? Nenzu hummed and smiled as he examined the dog that had been waiting outside the gates of the school for the past week. After two weeks of watching the dog come and go with one of his students, he finally got curious enough to venture out and meet the creature himself. A member of my staff says you aren't the being you claim to be. He spoke in his usual soft, cheerful tone. Being an animal myself, I just had to meet the being that scared hound dog so badly. The forest thing tilted his head. This school has a lot of unique characters. Within two weeks of being here, he had met two people who could hold eye contact with him and a handful of teenagers that either didn't notice or didn't care about his strange appearance. Nenzu had noticed the strange appearance of the dog the first day it showed up outside the gate. But being a pro hero, he's seen a lot of strange things throughout his life and this creature wasn't going to scare him off just because it looked strange. If he knew anything, he knew this thing wasn't a dog, and seeing as it always came and left with one of the students, it probably wasn't a threat either. If you speak with me, I'll make you some tea Nenzu offered with a smile. He didn't know if the creature could speak, but from watching it interact with young Bakugo, he knew it understood. Izuku debated whether or not he should change to his humanoid form and greet the rat. But it could be a trick, he might try to keep him away from Katsuki, or try to keep him away from the school. He didn't want to risk it. The dog simply laid down on the grass patch he had been sitting on, the same place he had been waiting for his kid every day for the past two weeks. The principal looked a bit disappointed when the creature declined his offer of tea. He was hoping to have a conversation with him, he had so many questions for the dog. Unfortunately, it didn't want to talk today. Maybe tomorrow then. He hummed as he reached into his pocket and placed a dog treat in front of the dog. And with that, Nedzu walked back to the school. He walked into the teacher's lounge, still thinking about the creature outside the gates. I wonder if Aizawa would have more luck. It does seem to like him. Nedzu thought out loud as he made himself a cup of hot tea. Who seems to like me? The tired teacher asked as he sat up from his napping place on the floor. The principal smiled and sipped his freshly brewed tea. The creature that follows your student to and from school every day. It's piqued my interest and I wish to find out more about it. I see, Aizawa mumbled. His eyes drifted towards the window that looked out over the gate where the dog had been sitting on the first day of school. Assuming it's not a dog, 
What do you think it is? Nedzu followed the teacher's gaze out the window, looking thoughtful for a moment. The most logical answer would be a human whose quirk allows them to somehow transform into a dog. But seeing as your quirk had no effect on it, I don't think we're dealing with a person. Aizawa looked away from the window as he stepped out from his sleeping bag and made his way towards the coffee machine. And Hound Dog's reaction to it suggests that it isn't simply an intelligent animal like you he added. Precisely. Nedzu sipped his tea again. Now you see why I wish to know more. Turning to look at the principal, a mug of hot coffee in his hand, Aizawa nods. So you want me to see if I can get more information because it tends to actually react to my presence. And you can ask young Bakugo about it since they seem to be friends. I'm guessing I don't get a choice in this. Of course not. Izuku didn't understand why Katsuki hid his smiles from his classmates. Not the angry smiles, or the mischievous ones. No, he let those ones show. Izuku didn't understand why he hid genuine and happy smiles whenever his classmates were around. Could he simply just want to seem tough? Or did he think showing happiness would show weakness? The forest thing noticed. He noticed every smile his kid tried to hide. He'd smile when his friends would fawn over him, mean a baby talking and saying sweet things to the dog, and Denki sometimes bringing treats as peace offerings as he put it. He'd smile when Ijiro would call him manly. Or if any of his friends gave him a compliment. So why does he try to hide it? Why doesn't he let them see him smile? Izuku stared at Katsuki from across the bedroom. They had gotten home around an hour ago and Katsuki is trying to do his homework. As if he could feel the eyes of his friend watching him. Katsuki turned around in his desk chair to look at Izuku with a questioning look. Are you just gonna stare at me? Or are you actually gonna ask me something? Izuku continued to stare for a moment before his form started to change. The familiar sound of cracking bones erupting from his body as it changed from dog to human. And again, he just stared. They both stared. Neither moved. Besides Katsuki blinking. And neither spoke. The silent staring went on for about two minutes before Izuku finally spoke up. Why don't you smile in front of your friends? He asked with his head tilted slightly to the side, green hair moving with it. Turning back to his homework now, Katsuki huffed. They aren't my friends, they just don't leave me alone. Izuku wasn't buying it. They are your friends. Don't think I don't see how you interact with them, Katsuki. Silence. I've seen how happy you get when they're around and I've noticed how you try to hide it, Izuku continued. Why do you care so much about whether or not I have friends? You're not my dad, Deku. This made Izuku laugh a little. I basically am, don't try to deny it. You're my kid. It was true. Izuku had all but legally adopted Katsuki by the time he was ten. Katsuki scoffed in reply. He agreed but he didn't want to admit it. He didn't want to admit that the being he found in a forest and brought home as his dog was somehow a better parental figure than his real parents. The blonde pushed his now finished homework to the side then turned to look at the forest thing again. This time with a faintly amused expression. Okay, dad, do you want me to make cupcakes for my class too? Katsuki asked mockingly and both of them laughed. As the two stopped laughing and silence once again filled the room, Izuku remembered what he had been waiting all day to ask Katsuki. Is one of your teachers a bipedal rat? He blurted out the question, green eyes staring into red ones. The blonde raised an eyebrow at his friend. The principal of UA, Nenzu, is a rat, or at least he looks like one. That made sense. The rat had spoken like he was the head of the school. Maybe Izuku could convince him to let him onto the school grounds. Then he could be with his kid all day and meet the rest of his classmate. He wanted to speak with me and offered tea in exchange for a conversation. Do you think I can convince him to let me into the school? Or to let me join the field trip to the training facility tomorrow? This time it was Katsuki's turn to stare. Did Nedzu somehow know Izuku wasn't a dog? Why didn't he confront Katsuki about it? Did he just assume that Katsuki didn't know? Wait, you didn't, right? Didn't what? Izuku tilted his head to the right slightly. Didn't talk to the principal. You could get arrested or something. Katsuki's voice said he was worried, but his expression said he was angry. Izuku just shook his head. Good. Nobody else needs to know you aren't a dog. I don't want them to take you away or some dumb bullshit. Izuku smiled widely, showing his many sharp teeth. Katsuki Bakugo, you do care. No, I don't. To say that Izuku was disappointed that he couldn't accompany the class of high schoolers on their field trip to the rescue training facility would be an understatement. He wanted to watch Katsuki and his classmates practice saving people, but he got his hopes too high. He wasn't even allowed to get on the bus with them. Izuku just watched as the bus of teenagers drove off down the street. It's not a big deal, Izuku can just follow them. Because of their bond, he can sense where Katsuki is, even if he's far away. The kid always wondered why the forest thing was so good at hide and seek. He'd just follow his senses and he'll eventually get there, he doesn't have to rush. Izuku started to stroll down the same street the bus had driven away on, enjoying the calm, sunny morning as he went. Occasionally he stopped to smell some flowers or let a person pet him. Then suddenly he got a bad feeling. Katsuki sat next to Kirishima on the bus ride to the USJ facility. 
He was the least annoying out of all his classmates. He was currently watching Ada scold almost the entire class for different things. Kaminari was standing on his seat. Siro was trying to knock him over. Kirishima was laughing which only encouraged them. Minda was being himself and had gotten his gravity turned off because of it. And Ida was trying to control the chaos. Katsuki was almost silent. Apart from a few snickers or amused grunts, he was just quiet. He knew exactly why he was being quiet. He was pissed off. Pissed off that the stupid driver and stupid teachers wouldn't let Izuku come with him. It made him angry because he knew how excited Izuku was to see him do rescue training, and it almost physically hurt to see his friend so disappointed. Bakubro, why are you glaring at the seat? Did it offend you? Kirishima asked jokingly, his usual wide smile showing off his sharp teeth. The blonde turned to look at the redhead, red eyes meeting red eyes. It's nothing, shitty hair he growled. Kirishima raised an eyebrow, curiosity filling his eyes. Then why are you so angry? I said, it's nothing. Katsuki snapped. That's obviously a lie. Both boys looked up to see Mina peeking over the seat in front of them. You're always mad about something. This time my guess is you're angry about the teachers not letting you bring your dog. Katsuki only glared more, turning his head away from his two nosy classmates. That's it, isn't it? You're pouting because they wouldn't let Izuku on the bus. Mina smiled triumphantly, having figured out the reason her grumpy friend was so grumpy today. It's super manly how much you love your dog, Bakubro. Kirishima laughed as he patted Katsuki's shoulder, earning a grunt from his friend. Katsuki mentally sighed in relief as the bus stopped outside the big glass dome that was the USJ facility. He stood up and all but shoved his classmates out of his way as he walked off the bus, trying to get away from the conversation and to get this trip over with. Once all the students are off the bus, Aizawa and Thirteen lead them into the building then gather them into a group once again to give a small speech before they begin. Just as Thirteen finished their speech about how the lesson will be about using their quirks to save people's lives, a dark portal opens in the middle of the facility and dozens of villains start pouring out. Is this part of the exercise? Kirishima asked as he and the rest of the class watched the villains swarm around the fountain in the middle of all the different disaster simulation. No, this is real. Aizawa grabbed his capture weapon and shared a look with Thirteen. Keep all the students here. Thirteen nodded as they watched Aizawa run down the steps ready to fight every villain that dares to threaten his students. Katsuki felt so useless just standing there and not doing anything. He hated feeling helpless. Katsuki thought back to the last time he felt so helpless. It was the night he met Izuku. He had purposefully gotten lost in the woods and started to panic. That's when Izuku appeared and helped him get back to his parents. Wait Izuku. Taking a deep breath, Katsuki let his panic take hold as he watched the dark, bird-like monster attack his teacher. His heart started to beat faster, his hands started to tremble and sweat. And within less than a minute, he had the forest thing by his side, growling and ready to kill anything that tried to hurt the kid he had adopted. What is a dog doing here? Thirteen questioned as they tried to keep all the students together. Katsuki and Izuku looked at each other and the forest thing knew what to do, no words needed. As the forest thing took off running down the steps to help Aizawa fight the villains, a few students called out to him, sounding worried for the dog. Back you go, shouldn't you stop him? Mina shouted at him but Katsuki only smirked. They're so fucked. The familiar feeling of transformation washed over Izuku's body as he shed his dog-like disguise, replacing it with his natural form, which looked anything but natural. It closely resembled a wendigo if its body were made from trees and fur from moss and grass, emerald green eyes glowing from within his head that now looked like a deer skull. Izuku tackled the monster that pinned Aizawa to the ground, his sharp claws digging into the Namu's dark flesh. The villains looked just as surprised and horrified as the students did as they watched the dog transform into a monster that looked like it came out of a storybook. That isn't all might, screeched the villain that seemed to be the leader of the attack, a young man with blue hair and severed hands attached to his upper body. Izuku growled loudly as he ripped the arms off the Namu, only for the arms to grow back a few seconds later. This time, the villain leader laughed maniacally. That won't work, Namu can regenerate any part of its body what the fuck. Everyone watched as Izuku's jaw unhinged and wrapped around the Namu, swallowing it whole. The plaza fell silent. Everyone just stared at the forest thing that just ate the monster that was created to kill All Might. Izuku slowly turned to look at the villain's leader, only for him to rush back through the portal he came through, leaving all the minor villains to be arrested. Izuku let himself change back to his dog-like form as he made his way to the injured form of Aizawa, helping the teacher stand and bringing him back up the steps to where the class was waiting. Looks of shock and horror still plastered on their faces as they stared at Izuku. Though, Katsuki only looked mildly surprised. As Thirteen ran over and took Aizawa from Izuku, helping him the rest of the way up the stairs, Izuku trotted over to Katsuki, receiving many head pats and praises. What the hell is that thing? A small, purple student screamed as he watched Katsuki treat Izuku, the creature who just ate a monster the size of All Might, like an adorable puppy. 
He's my dog, Katsuki replied nonchalantly, standing up from hugging his dog like best friend. Mina was the first to just accept that this dog was weird. She kneeled down next to Izuku, wrapping her arms around him, thanking him for eating the big bad monster as she put it. Then the rest of the class joined in, except for the purple kid who just looked horrified, all of them petting and praising Izuku and Aizawa for beating the villains, a few asking where Katsuki had found the dog. Katsuki would just smirk, saying something along the lines of, he came to me or he adopted me. Izuku just wondered if they would let him into the school with Katsuki now that he saved the lives of an entire class and a pro hero. They'll definitely have a hard time keeping him out if his kid has anything to say about it. But Izuku did know one thing for certain, he's going to protect all of these kids. When the heroes and police arrived at the USJ to arrest the rest of the villains, they were filled in on what had happened and every student was questioned, all of them telling the police about Izuku with great amazement. Well, besides Katsuki. He wasn't really that shocked by what had happened, and surprisingly neither was some kid with purple hair and a constant tired expression, he kinda reminded Izuku of Aizawa. Once everyone was safely back at the school, Nenzu stopped Katsuki before he went through the front gate and asked to speak with him and Izuku quickly. He actually hadn't asked for Izuku, but he assumed he would be there since he asked for Katsuki. He was correct. The three stood outside the gate in the shade of a big tree. The teen and the forest thing feeling somewhat anxious about what the principal wanted to speak with them about. I had already come to the conclusion that your dog wasn't actually a dog, nor a human for that matter. But now I see that it is a bit more than that. The principal started, his voice soft and cheerful. Izuku looked at Katsuki who looked back. They both silently hoped that this conversation was going where they thought it was. Nedzu took notice of their silent conversation, noting the obvious bond the two have. He can speak, correct? The rat asked, turning his attention to Katsuki. The blonde looked between the principal and the dog for a moment before shaking his head. Not like this, Nedzu hummed in understanding. Izuku can't talk in his dog form. The forest thing noticed the rat's intense gaze and froze for a second, tilting his head slightly to the right. Why is he looking Uo Izuku thought as he realized what the rat wanted him to do. He looked around, making sure nobody else was around before looking at Katsuki who gave a stiff nod. With that, Izuku stood up and the sound of cracking bones and ripping skin echoed through the street as the dog slowly turned humanoid until the form of a short, young-looking boy stood in front of Nezu. Izuku shook his green tufts of hair away from his eyes, sneezing softly as it tickled his nose. He turned to the rat who looked all too pleased with himself as he stuck out his paw for a shake. Izuku smiled widely, his too many teeth perfectly on show as he shook the principal's hand paw. I am Principal Nedzu. It's a pleasure to meet the being that saved one of my classes and two of my teachers. I'm Izuku. Katsuki calls me Deku. Izuku mentally sighed in relief at Nedzu's friendly reaction to his transformation, knowing he definitely scared a bunch of students earlier. So what's this about, rat? Katsuki interrupted, earning a smack on the shoulder from his eldritch parent. Nedzu chuckled at the pair in front of him. Yes, what is this about? He started, grabbing the attention of the two boys. I simply wanted to inform you, Izuku, that after your service at the USJ I've decided to grant you access to the school and its grounds. You are free to come and go as you please. Izuku was ecstatic, to say the least. And even though Katsuki didn't show it, he was also fairly happy about this development. You can go retrieve any belongings you left in the school then go home. Enjoy your weekend, you too. Nedzu smiled and left to finalize things with the police. Victory ice cream, Izuku suggested as he turned to look at Katsuki. Fuck yeah. The weekend passed agonizingly slow. Izuku couldn't wait to go to class with Katsuki, and Katsuki just wanted to get back to training. Katsuki was annoyed about not getting to do any training at the USJ but it was overshadowed by his excitement about showing off his progress in combat skills to Izuku on Monday. The excitement only made the wait seem longer. It felt like an eternity had passed before Monday finally came, but it did. It finally did. Izuku trotted along beside Katsuki as they walked through the school gates. He had received his own idea of sorts that allowed him to enter the school, like the ones the students carried with them. Back you go, Izuku. Nina exclaimed happily as she skipped over to the blonde and his dog. I see Nedzu finally let you bring him in. Is he gonna come to class too? Kaminari trailed behind her, almost as excited to see the dog as she was. Can he sit next to me? I brought dog treats. Kaminari literally buzzed with energy as he bounced up and down, electricity sparking and swirling around him. Before Katsuki could respond to either of their questions, they continued. These two were definitely excited to see Izuku. Most of the girls want to meet him, he's like a celebrity. Mina followed Katsuki and Izuku who started walking to class. Takoyami, too. I think he said something about demons. Kaminari added, Did you extras inject caffeine into your veins? Why the fuck are you so loud and energetic this early? Katsuki snapped, sparks popping from his palm. 
His classmates only laughed at his outburst. They were used to his anger by now and it wouldn't stop their excitement. It usually only encouraged them. Katsuki growled as the small group walked into classroom 1A, catching the attention of the students already in the room. Why is that thing here? It's not gonna eat me, right? Minda screeched at the sight of Izuku. Izuku looked at Katsuki. The blonde's expression didn't change, but Izuku could see the devious look that filled his crimson eyes and he knew what it meant. Izuku bounced up, his big front paws landing on the desk in front of him as he barked loudly in the direction of the small, loud student. Another scream echoing through the room and down the hallway as Minda hid behind a student with multiple arms. Katsuki laughed maniacally, patting Izuku's head as the dog returned to his side. No, he doesn't like grapes. Back Hugo, stop scaring our classmates. Ada scolded, watching the blonde take a seat at his desk. Izuku sitting next to him. Katsuki ignored him, choosing to watch as his classmates fawned over Izuku instead, an amused expression plastered on his face, knowing how much Izuku likes the attention. Izuku found it odd that nobody spoke about what he had done at the USJ, besides a few students thanking him. Some even brought small gifts for him, like pretty rocks and feathers, or small dog treats. I see you've all met your new classmate. Aizawa drawled as he stood in front of the class, making eye contact with Izuku. As much as Aizawa acted like Izuku joining the class was a nuisance, Izuku knew the teacher didn't mind. Aizawa had already thanked the forest thing for keeping the kids safe and for saving his life. And if anything, Izuku would help make sure the chaotic teens didn't get into too much trouble. As Aizawa started the lesson, the forest thing looked around at the students. He wanted to know what each of them was like, which of them needed help, maybe find a new victim of his illegal adopting. Illegal adopting, Izuku thought. That's what Kakin calls it. Izuku turned to his right and immediately noticed a few students staring at him, their expressions getting increasingly more worried the more they stared. No doubt they've noticed Izuku's appearance. Thankfully, they didn't seem scared. Izuku didn't want these kids to be scared of him. Then he noticed the rather intense stare from a boy with half-red, half-white hair and a scar over his left eye. He didn't look worried or scared by Izuku's appearance. The kid looked like he was thinking. Izuku met his eyes and got a strange feeling. He wasn't used to being the one getting weird feelings. He usually did that to other people. It felt like deep hatred for someone, but not Izuku. It felt like the kid was suffering. Izuku's senses hadn't gone this crazy since before he left the forest. This one, this one will be the next victim of his illegal adopting. But let's be honest, most of this class will be. Back Hugo, Shadow interrupted abruptly. Katsuki turned his attention away from the small group of energetic extras to look at his quiet classmate. What do you want, Icy Hot? He sneered at the heterochromatic boy who stood a few feet away. This caught the attention of the rest of the group, the loud teenagers silencing suddenly at the appearance of the Todoroki child. I want to know more about your he paused, glancing towards the blonde's strange, dog-like companion before turning back to the blonde himself. Dog, I find it strange that nobody has asked about or even mentioned what happened at the USJ. Yeah, man, I don't think that's a dog, Siro added. Katsuki growled. What the hell do you expect me to say, considering I found him in the woods like... Eight years ago, for all I know he could be some eldritch forest god. You're so great at acting dumb, Kakin. Izuku thought sarcastically. God is a big stretch though. Isn't eight old for a dog? How old is he? Kaminari questioned, ignoring the fact that Katsuki pretty much outright told them he wasn't a dog. Infinity. Katsuki shrugged nonchalantly. This only caused his classmates to ask more questions. And they had so many. Except for Shouto. He's having another staring contest with Izuku. And just like the staring teacher, Shadow didn't seem phased by the increasingly disturbing appearance of the forest thing. HM Shadow hummed, turning to Katsuki who was now watching as the rest of the group debated on what kind of forest god Izuku is and whether or not their group is a cult. Can I pet him? Knock yourself out. Katsuki replied without looking at his heterochromatic classmate. Shadow approached Izuku slowly, holding the same stoic expression as he held his hand out towards the creature in front of him. Izuku immediately shoved his head into Shadow's hand catching a glimpse of a small smile from the teen as he petted the forest thing's head and sensing the faint air of happiness as Izuku leaned against his legs. Soon enough Shouto was sitting on the ground with Izuku next to him, still petting the dog as he absent-mindedly spoke to the creature. It had slipped his mind that Izuku could most likely understand everything he's saying. It's easy to forget that Izuku isn't actually a dog, Katsuki had done it many times over the years. You are the nicest being I've ever met. My father never let me have a pet. Shouto spoke quietly. Eyebrows furrowed and a small frown spread across his features. Izuku listened carefully to everything the child said. The parent not letting their kid have a pet isn't uncommon. Not everyone can handle it. But the way he said it made Izuku suspicious. Does he have a bad home life? Is he being neglected? Is it worse than that? Izuku didn't know. But he'd be damned if he wasn't going to figure it out. Once Katsuki and Izuku were home, 
Izuku was changing to his humanoid form as soon as the bedroom door was shut. He tussled his viridian hair, a few stray leaves and sticks falling out of the curly, green mess gently landing on the floor. After adjusting to his human form, Izuku quickly turned to Katsuki, pointing a long, clawed finger at him, almost accusingly. What do you know about the pro-hero endeavor? Katsuki raised an eyebrow. That was sudden. Why do you care? He questioned. Just answer the question, Kakin. The blonde flops down into his desk chair, raising his hands in surrender almost mockingly. He's an asshole, and judging by the offhanded comments Icy Hot always makes, he's even more of an asshole than the media shows. I was afraid of that. Izuku muttered as he sat down, resting his head on his hand, long fingers tapping against his chin in thought. He'll have to take the time to investigate Shouto's home situation. Maybe the rest of the students as well, just to be safe. He could disguise himself as a small animal or insect so he won't be noticed. Is that creepy? Should he just talk to them instead? Probably not. They might not be comfortable speaking with him. Should he tell Katsuki? They don't usually keep things from each other but he doesn't want to make his kid worry. Even if Katsuki would never admit to being worried. It's probably best to not tell him yet. He might try to stop Izuku from taking care of the other kids. Katsuki only looked more confused the longer he watched Izuku think. Why do you care? You don't usually ask about heroes. Izuku shook his head. Don't worry about it, dynamite. Katsuki huffed as he crossed his arms, glaring at the floor. He hated it when Izuku didn't tell him things. They told each other everything. Why is he suddenly keeping secrets? Quiet giggling pulled him from his thoughts. He looked up to see Izuku watching him with a smug smile giggling his ass off. What? Why are you laughing? Katsuki snapped, making Izuku laugh more. You're pouting, it's adorable. Izuku smiled widely, his sharp teeth shining in the light. Katsuki's face turned red, crimson eyes growing wider. I don't pout. I'm not stop laughing. He yelled at the eldritch being sitting across from him. He picked up a pillow, throwing it at Izuku's head, only for him to snort and laugh harder when the pillow hit him in the face. Where's your phone? Your face is so red, I want to take a picture. Izuku looked around the room in search of the phone. Katsuki quickly grabbed his phone, shoving it in his pocket. No, I already have mom and dad to embarrass me. You're supposed to be the cool parent. So you admit it. I am your parent. Izuku shouted accusingly. Katsuki groaned and face planted onto the bed next to Izuku, covering his head with a pillow as his pet cryptid flopped on top of him, a few stray leaves falling from his green hair again. Awa, poor tough. Guy is gonna die from embarrassment. Woe is you. I swear, Deku, if you pull this shit at school, I'll never forgive you. Izuku smiled. Of course you'll forgive me. You love me. I hate you. No, you love me. The night was dark. Stars littered the sky while the moon shone brightly. Yellow street lamps bringing light to the otherwise dark street. The feeling of safety lingered in the air despite the nighttime breeze. This neighborhood, in particular, was safer than any other neighborhood in the area. Probably for the simple fact that Endeavor, the number two hero, lived on this very street. Izuku had left the Bakugo residence after Katsuki fell asleep. Thankfully it didn't take long since the kid went to bed at 8.30. The forest thing didn't know why he went to bed so early but didn't question it. He had turned himself into a fly, despite the almost overwhelmingly uncomfortable feeling that came with having an exoskeleton, and made his way to the neighborhood where the Todorokis lived. It was a nice place in the more fancy part of the city where everything was more expensive and everyone was fairly wealthy. Izuku flew around until he found the right house. A large, beautiful building with a big garden, surrounded by a tall wall, probably to keep prying eyes from looking in on the family. He flew in through an open window that led to the kitchen and noticed a young woman with white, shoulder-length hair, a crimson color scattered throughout her silver locks. She was washing dishes, no doubt from the dinner her family had just eaten. Izuku assumed she was Shouto's sister since she was far too young to be his mother. Was she being mistreated as well? Hearing the TV from the other room, Izuku left the kitchen in search of his newly adopted child. When he reached the room where the TV was playing, he saw a boy that definitely wasn't Shouto. He had messy silver hair, much like the girl he had seen in the kitchen, gray eyes, and looked a few years older than Shouto. A crooked grin spread across his face as he watched some show Izuku didn't recognize. But he's not the boy Izuku is looking for, so he moves on to the nest room. Over the next ten minutes, he managed to search the whole house. Endeavor wasn't home, probably out being a hero somewhere. But he hadn't found the one person he came to check on. He wasn't in the dining room, he wasn't in the training room, and he wasn't in any of the bedrooms. So where is he? Izuku went back to the kitchen, passing the girl as he flew back through the open window. He circled the house, searching the garden for any sign of Shouto Todoroki. And soon enough, as he came around the backside of the house, there was the heterochromatic boy, leaning against a tree with what looked like a memorial next to it. A clean, white stone that stuck out of the ground, riding across the front of it. As Izuku got closer he noticed Shouto was talking. Who is he talking to? Nobody else is around. 
Izuku got closer and closer, listening to what the kid was saying. He's talking about his dad. Izuku looked around, trying to figure out who he was talking to. Then his eyes landed on the memorial that sat next to Shouto. Taoya Todoroki written in big letters on the pristine stone. Shouto isn't talking to someone here in the yard. He's talking to someone dead. Someone who probably meant a lot to the boy when they were alive, most likely a sibling. Izuku felt his heart break as he listened to him talk. Talk to thin air because the person he was trying to talk to wasn't there. Fayumi cooked tonight. He spoke quietly. She's always been good at cooking he trailed off, seemingly in thought. Shouto looked down at his hand as they fidgeted with the hem of the shirt he was wearing. Endeavor was too busy for training today. He mostly ignored us. It's better than what he usually does, I guess. Izuku's anger boiled inside of him and he had to fight to keep his composure and not transform just to hug the sad teenager in front of him. What had Endeavor done to make being neglected seem so good in the eyes of the young Todoroki child? Izuku could bear to think about it. I got to pet a dog today. Well maybe not a dog, but it was just as fluffy as I imagined. I wonder why we were never allowed to have pets, Shouto sighed, thinking about his interaction with Izuku earlier. It was such a new experience to him and he could still remember the warm feeling in his chest when Izuku had sat with him during break. Shouto turned to look at the memorial for his older brother. He was the only one that visited it anymore. I wish I could leave this place, Taoya. He spoke so softly, Izuku could barely hear it. He wanted to jump out and hug the boy so badly, to pet his hair and tell him everything would be okay. He needs to save these children. No, he will save these children. The next morning when Izuku and Katsuki walked into class, Izuku found his way to Shouto's desk where the heterochromatic boy sat silently as his classmates conversed around him. The forest thing gently laid his head on the boy's lap, ignoring the jealous looks he got from everyone, including Katsuki. Shouto looked down at the creature and petted his head gently, traces of a grin pulling at the corners of his mouth. Hello, Izuku. How are you today? He asked, not expecting a verbal answer since dogs don't typically speak. But the wagging tail of the forest thing was answer enough for him. I found this for you, he said as he stuck a small, dark green feather into the dog's collar. If only the students knew how much Izuku loved the little gifts and tokens they brought for him. Every button, every feather, every rock, Izuku loved them all. Of course, Katsuki knew. He had been bringing Izuku such gifts for as long as they had known each other. And Katsuki had to listen to Izuku ramble on and on about everything his classmates brought for him. When Aizawa walked in and started the class, Izuku quietly slipped away, making his way down the hall towards Nenzu's office. As much as he wanted to listen to Aizawa's lecture or Kaminari and Siro's hush jokes, he needed to have a little chat with the principal about some of the students at the school. Izuku reached the door of the office and pushed it open with one of his big paws. He didn't need to knock. Knowing Nenzu he probably already knew the forest thing was there. The office was simple. Bookshelves filled with books, notebooks, and files, a comfy couch across from Nenzu's desk, a few books and magazines laying on the coffee table. The rat sat at his desk. He had been talking to a skinny man with crazy blonde hair when Izuku walked in. Why do so many people in this school have blonde hair? Who the man paused, staring at Izuku only to turn away quickly after noticing the dog's strange appearance. Is that a dog? Nedzu's ever-present grin widened. We've been calling him a dog, but we are aware that that is not the case. The rat turned his attention to the being that made himself comfortable on the couch while the uncomfortable-looking small mite scooted away from him. Hello, Izuku. Nenzu greeted as he sauntered over to the kettle. Did you come to have tea with me finally? Izuku took this as an invitation to change form. He would have done it anyway, but at least the principal was expecting it. Izuku felt slightly bad for the poor man who sat confused on the other side of the couch. The familiar sound of cracking bones, breaking skin, and the rustling of clothes echoed in the office for a moment until the form of the dog was replaced with a teenage-looking boy with viridian hair and freckles. Nedzu simply handed the forest thing a cup of hot tea, acting as if the being's strange presence was anything but strange. I came to speak with you. I'm worried about one of the kids, Izuku explained before sipping his tea. The tea is delicious, Nenzu. Thank you, isn't it just? The rat smiled as he drank his own tea. Which student are you worried about? Nenzu, is this a student? The blonde man interrupted, confusion evident in his voice. Sorry, it was rude of me to not introduce myself. Izuku apologized, extending a hand with long fingers and dark claw-like nails for a handshake. I'm Izuku, Izuku smiled. He didn't really have a last name. He always introduced himself as just Izuku whenever he met some, or at least Katsuki introduced him as such. Izuku and Katsuki are family. Would he be considered a Bakugo? He'll have to ask later. The man hesitantly shook Izuku's hand. He seemed at a loss for words. Izuku, this is All Might. I trust you won't tell anyone about his different appearance, having an odd appearance yourself. Nedzu smiled and poured himself another cup of tea. Izuku nodded in understanding. 
Now that introductions are out of the way, I'm going to be blunt. I'm worried about Shouto Todoroki and his siblings. I have reason to believe they are being mistreated. All Might's eyes widened as he looked between Izuku and Nenzu, no doubt shocked by what the forest thing had just accused his fellow hero of doing. I appreciate you bringing this information to me, Izuku. This isn't a villain or a beast. It's not something you can deal with legally. Nedzu acknowledged. I will talk to Detective Tsukachi about investigating the Todoroki household. A thorough investigation. Izuku corrected. Nedzu and the forest thing nodded to each other before Izuku stood and left the office, letting the other two get back to whatever they were talking about before. Hopefully, he made the right decision by telling someone instead of just killing Endeavor. He doesn't like killing people, but occasionally it's necessary. Izuku would kill God if it meant his kids would be safe. When Izuku returned to the classroom, already back in dog form, he was just in time to hear Aizawa tell the students about the upcoming sports festival. Honestly, the idea of the students fighting each other and most likely getting injured made Izuku a little worried, to say the least. But after the students left for their break, Aizawa offered Izuku his own job during the festival, or rather, jobs. For the first job, he would act as part of the security for the event, making sure no villains or possible troublemakers got inside. Unfortunately, he was told he couldn't keep Endeavor out of the event. And for the second job, this one was Izuku's favorite. He would be moral support for the competing students. This meant that while he's patrolling the building as part of the security, he would also be checking up on and making sure students were okay for the competition. He would also spend a lot of time in recovery girl's office with students who were also recovering physically. At first, Izuku was confused about the second job, since he's not trained and a counselor would be a better choice. But Aizawa explained that most students would rather the comfort of a big fluffy dog than talking to a stranger, even if a professional would be better. And that's how Izuku got here, the halls of the stadium, just after the obstacle race finished. The dark green collar he usually wore when he went out was now replaced by a thin rope, holding up a sign around his neck that Mina and Denki made for him. White painted cardboard with big black writing on it, saying, My name is Izuku. I'm student moral support, come pet me. It had glitter, stickers, and little drawings all over it like it was decorated by a bunch of little kids. Izuku loved it. The students had a small break after the obstacle race, Achako coming in first place after distracting her opponents and quickly floating over the finish line with Shouto and Katsuki close behind her. Now it was time for the cavalry battle. Izuku was just wondering why all these events had to be so violent. Obviously, he knew why, but if every event was made for students like Katsuki who had physical fighting quirks, then all the students, like Shinzo, who didn't would be at a serious disadvantage. Why not make one of the events a puzzle? Test the minds of the students for once instead of making everything about having the strongest or flashiest quirk. The forest thing trotted down the hallway as he made his way outside the watch the cavalry battle and to cheer up any students who didn't make it to the second event, but paused when he smelled something, or someone vaguely familiar. The scent reminded him of Shouto, so it was probably one of his siblings who came to watch him compete. At least, Izuku hoped it was one of his siblings. He didn't know what he would do if he saw Endeavor after finding out what he did. He didn't think it was Endeavor though. He would most likely sense the negativity the man radiates from across the stadium and as far as he could tell, the flaming dumpster hasn't arrived yet. Curiosity getting the better of him. Izuku follows his nose to try and figure out who his senses were telling him to track down. Izuku walked through the door and started walking through the rows of seats. Some people stopping him to pet him or just to stare at him because he still looks weird. He managed to spot the Todoroki siblings sitting together closer to the first row so they could call out to their little brother to cheer him on. But when he found the person he'd been tracking through the stadium, all he saw was a young man wearing a black hoodie with the hood pulled so far forward Izuku could only see the black hair pocketing out. Who is this guy? Izuku didn't realize he was staring at the guy until he looked directly at Izuku, made a face that he didn't understand due to the scars that obscured the man's facial expression. Then he stood up and walked to a different seat, mumbling something about Izuku being a creepy-ass dog. That was weird. I've seen some weird things in my life, but that was weird. Izuku thought as he made his way towards the student seating area to sit with the students who did make it into the second event, and to watch the almost-finished cavalry battle. The last 30 seconds of the battle Izuku got to watch was mostly the teams Bakugo and Todoroki fighting over the 10 million point headband while other teams who were still standing tried to interfere. The whole time present Mike narrated with a few quiet comments from Aizawa. Izuku would be lying if he said he didn't laugh when the battle ended and Katsuki fell right onto his face after a failed attempt at stealing the 10 million headband from Shouto. He didn't feel too bad about laughing since Katsuki stood up immediately and started yelling while all his friends laughed just like Izuku was. The forest thing ran out onto the field to congratulate the students who won and comfort the students who didn't. He almost trampled mine to accidentally, but he was too excited to think about it before he jumped and tackled Katsuki back to the ground. 
No, Izu stop. You said you wouldn't do this at school. Katsuki yelled as he tried to shove the dog off him. Izuku barked loudly and put all his weight on the teen, pinning him to the ground while most of the students and bystanders laugh at them. Hey, Izuku, I want hugs too. Izuku jumped off of Katsuki after hearing Ijiro call to him and ran to jump onto the other teen. This time he was ready to be jumped on, so Ijiro didn't fall over like Katsuki did. Izuku held himself up with his big paws on the redhead's shoulders as the boy hugged him and laughed. Some of the other students joined in on hugs as well until they were all told by midnight to go inside and prepare for the next event. Izuku walked beside Katsuki, mentally laughing every time he looked at the blonde. He had dirt all over him and looked so grumpy and every time Izuku nudged his hand to get his attention, all he would say is, Fuck off, I told you I wouldn't forgive you. Or, stop it, you're not the cool parent anymore. He knew it wouldn't be long until Katsuki stopped pouting and his grumpiness only made Izuku laugh more. Izuku watched as Katsuki stalked off to his waiting room to relax before the next event and soon most of the students went their separate ways to enjoy their break before the tournament. A gentle hand placed itself on Izuku's back and the forest thing turned around to see another one of Class 1A's blondes, Ajiro. Izuku didn't know him very well. He never really spent time with the dog like his classmates did. Izuku did know he decided to withdraw from the event after the cavalry battle. Hey there, Ajiro smiled bashfully. I was told you'd be here for student support. I like your sign. Izuku gently nudged the boy's side as he pets the forest thing's head and back. Izuku could sense the disappointment coming from him, no doubt a result of the cavalry battle and withdrawing from the tournament. As much as Izuku didn't know Ajiro, he was still one of his kids and he doesn't like it when his kids aren't happy. But since he doesn't know the boy well enough, he doesn't really know how to cheer him up. Thankfully the boy seemed to grow more content as he petted the dog, the feeling of disappointment eventually being replaced by a calm and peaceful one. I understand why Todoroki likes you so much, Anjiro tittered. Looking at the dog, he only seemed to hesitate a little after noticing Izuku's odd appearance, which was a win since most people tend to run away or leave quickly after noticing. Well, they used to. It's been happening a lot less since he's come to UA. It's a nice change but it still surprises him sometimes. Izuku sat with Ajiro for a few minutes until the teen felt better and decided to go find his friends after thanking Izuku for helping him feel better. Izuku really likes this job. Katsuki gently iced the bruises he gained from the cavalry battle. It always pissed him off how he bruised so easily. He hated it, it made him feel weak. He didn't even notice the dirt on his arms, face, and clothes. He hasn't looked in the mirror since getting to his waiting room. He just wanted to chill out a little before the tournament started. Katsuki threw his shirt off, letting it fall onto the back of a chair as he held the ice back on the big purple bruise forming on his ribs. He didn't know who exactly gave him these bruises, but he knew a few people who managed to get a hit or a kick in during the cavalry battle so he'll just have to kick their asses during the tournament. He was looking forward to fighting Icy Hot. He felt the need to kick his ass most of all after Todoroki managed to steal first place from him in the cavalry battle, then had the audacity to laugh when he got tackled by Deku. Speak of the devil, Izuku just burst into his room like he owns the place. The familiar sounds of the forest thing transforming from dog to human echoed through the room as soon as the door shut behind him. Ever heard of knocking? Katsuki snapped. He wasn't actually mad at Izuku, it's just his default to sound angry. The forest thing didn't respond. Instead, he decided the most damn thing to do would be to grab a cloth and wipe the dirt off of Katsuki's face, which he did, much to Katsuki's annoyance. Hey, really? Katsuki rolled his crimson eyes as Izuku forced him to hold still so he could wipe the dirt off the blonde's face. If it were anyone else, like his real dad, Katsuki would not just let it happen. But it's Izuku, he knows better than to fight it. You're such a dirty child. Izuku muttered as he gently used the damp cloth to get rid of the dirt on his kid's face. Katsuki raised a skeptical eyebrow at his eldritch parent who was always smeared with dirt and littered with seemingly endless amounts of leaves whenever he changed to his more humanoid form. What a hypocrite. It's your fault, you know. Katsuki looked at Izuku who was only a little shorter than he was. You were the one who tackled me. After you already face planted into the dirt. The damage was already done and I was proud of you for coming in second place. You deserved a hug. Izuku grinned widely, his sharp, white teeth shining in the light. Katsuki growled lowly at the mention of him coming second place. I fucking lost a stupid half and half. Izuku didn't flinch at Katsuki's sudden outburst. He was used to his kid's anger by now. Kaken, you didn't lose, you came second place. You're still in the game and you'll do great in the tournament. Maybe you'll even beat Shouto. Just don't kill anyone, okay? Try to control your anger. Izuku looked at Katsuki as he finished wiping off the last of the dirt from his face. Promise, dynamite. Katsuki rolled his eyes at all the nicknames. Izuku loved giving him nicknames. Fine, but I'm not going easy on those extras. I wouldn't expect you to. Izuku set the cloth down on the table. Now, do. 
Izuku was interrupted by the door opening, and he didn't have enough time to change forms so he turned around slowly, staring blankly at Shouto who stood in the doorway looking slightly confused. I didn't realize Bakugo would have company. Shouto spoke in his usual soft voice as he looked between Izuku and Katsuki. Why does nobody knock? Katsuki yelled. What the hell do you want, Icy Hot? Katsuki, be nice. Izuku scolded, emerald green eyes narrowing at the blonde who quickly shut up. I was looking for your dog. Where is he? The heterochromatic boy answered. Katsuki and Izuku shared a look for a moment, both of them wondering what to say. How do they explain this? But Shouto even understand. It's not every day your classmate's dog isn't actually a dog. And it's even less common for said not dog to be whatever Izuku is. Izuku hasn't even met another being like him. It's not easy to explain. No worries, Shouto. I'm just an immortal eldritch monster who's adopted you and pretty much the rest of your class. It sounds crazy. Katsuki was the first to speak up and surprisingly he didn't yell this time. He's not always a dog. He pointed at Izuku as he spoke so nonchalantly it was obvious this was normal for him. Izuku just smiled and waved. Shouto looked at Izuku and nodded slowly as some things started to make a little more sense. I see. Should I come back when he is? Izuku almost laughed a little. It certainly wasn't the reaction he was expecting but he knew Shouto was sometimes unpredictable with what he said. Back when he lived in the forest he would be lucky if people just screamed and ran away from him. A few times people attacked him. Whether they just found him and got scared or they were actively hunting him, he's received a fair amount of wounds from quirks, guns, and even some arrows. Izuku looked at Katsuki again, the blonde letting out an exasperated sigh as he picked up the ice pack again. I'm fine, you go. Shouto wasn't used to Katsuki talking in such a calm voice, it seemed very unusual, but Izuku didn't seem to find it odd so he assumed that Katsuki was calmer when Izuku was around. Izuku smiled and grabbed his sign from where he had hung it on a chair when he walked in. He hung the sign around his neck and soon he was walking out the door in dog form side by side with Shouto, who didn't seem too disturbed by the transformation from human to dog. But Izuku couldn't be sure since Shouto wasn't one to show emotions through facial expressions very often, something Izuku would have to help him with. Remind me again why we're watching these UA brats. We are looking for a student that could possibly be recruited. You know what we would be able to do if we had a spy inside UA. Fine. But there's no way we're even trying any of the brats that are protected by that thing. Izuku decided he didn't like the tournament. Besides the one support course girl, it was just 1A and 1B beating each other up. It was almost painful to watch all those kids purposefully hurt each other for a competition. He had watched the fights until the second round when Shouto was up against Shinzo. It was an odd matchup but most of the people watching knew how it would go. Shouto would easily take the win with his ice quirk. Pretty simple, right? Apparently not. Everyone sat at the edge of their seats, anxiously watching as Shouto had barely spoken a word to his purple-haired opponent when his eyes went blank and started walking towards the edge of the ring. The sound of Endeavor's voice echoed through the almost silent stadium as he yelled at Shouto to fight. The scene even had present Mike silent in shock, watching as Shouto walked over the line, only to realize what had happened when Shinso released him from his quirk. I say the purple brainwashing brat. I agree. He would make a good spy and he isn't followed by the dog you hate so much. That thing isn't a dog. I can handle dogs. But it is a powerful quirk. Sensei will like it. I lost Shouto mumbled. He was sitting on the floor, leaning against the wall as he petted Izuku who was laying next to him. Izuku was wondering why Shouto hadn't asked about or mentioned his human form but he assumed that Shouto just accepted Izuku for being really strange just like Katsuki's parents did. My father won't be happy about me losing. Shouto looked down, a smug smile making its way onto his lips as he thought about Endeavor's displeasure, forgetting about his loss momentarily. Shouto turned to Izuku and raised an eyebrow slowly as he stared for a few seconds. Why do you choose to be a dog? If you can be any creature you want, why be a dog? Apparently, Izuku spoke too soon. The question was met with silence. Izuku didn't know what to say. He couldn't really say anything in this form anyway. But he still felt bad about not answering the boy's questions. The only reason he chose the form of a dog is that Katsuki had requested a dog when they met in the forest and he just never thought about changing it. Admittedly, it surprised the forest thing that this was the question that Shouto asked. Not what are you? Or, do you eat people all the time? Just a simple, why a dog? Honestly, it was refreshing. It was always a relief when people didn't just assume he was a monster that ate people. Shouto. Izuku and Shouto turned to see Endeavor walking towards them. The flames that wrap around his body light up his angry expression like a spotlight. He looked pissed. Izuku stood over Shouto, his green eyes glowing brighter as he growled at Endeavor. The hero stepped closer only to step back again when the dog barked loudly at him. Is this the mutt you insist on wasting your time with? Honestly, Shouto, I don't see why you feel the need to rebel like this. Endeavor chided. He crossed his arms to look tough but he didn't dare take another step towards the dog and the child he's protecting. He's better than you. Shouto deadpanned. 
Endeavor took another step back. His eyes widened and his mouth hung open in shock by the comment from his youngest son. He didn't know how to respond. And as if Nedzu was watching the situation from the cameras and sent them to put a stop to this mess before it started, a detective and some police officers approached them. Excuse me, Endeavor? The detective grabbed the attention of the pro hero who looked like he was about to explode. We need you to answer some questions. Please come with us. Panic. Izuku had been watching Katsuki and Takoyami fight when he sensed a strong wave of panic, anger, and sadness. But he didn't recognize the source of the distress. Did that make sense? Probably not. Izuku can usually tell who's panicking by the way their panic feels if he's felt them panic before. This definitely wasn't Katsuki, but he knew it was one of the students. The forest thing jumped into action, following his senses as he ran inside, leaving a few confused students behind, wondering why the dog had taken off so fast. Izuku ran through the maze of hallways, desperately searching for the person who seemed like they were having a panic attack. He ran through the hallways, taking turn after turn, but unable to find the right place within this maze. It frustrated Izuku to no end. He just wanted to comfort the panicking student. Was that too much to ask? Unfortunately, Izuku got lost and couldn't find the person before the sense of panic withered away and Izuku lost the trail. If Izuku had hands right now, he would probably punch the wall in frustration, and if Katsuki saw he would mockingly scold him for having poor anger management. The little shit. He probably should have looked to see which students were missing before he left. That would have been a smart move. Good job, Izuku. The forest thing sat in the middle of the hallway, the sudden appearance and disappearance of the panicking person playing over and over in his head. They had disappeared so quickly as if they got in a car and drove off. It was possible that they had gotten in a car and left. But Izuku didn't know how they could get out of the maze-like building so fast. Along with confusion, Izuku felt guilt. He knew it was his job to help the students, especially the nervous ones. It was the whole reason he was given the job in the first place. He could sense the distress coming from the students. How had he gotten so distracted? How many people would be disappointed in him for letting a student have such a bad panic attack alone? The sound of cheering and loud voices broke Izuku from his spiral. That's the sound of midnight announcing the winner of the sports festival. And he was missing it. That morning he had promised Katsuki he would stay and watch him fight, stay and cheer him on. He couldn't even keep that simple promise. How could he do any other job correctly? Ignoring the feeling of growing anxiety inside his chest and pushing back the thoughts of being forced to return to the forest he had left over seven years ago, Izuku makes his way back through the maze of hallways and out to the field in the middle of the stadium to see who had won the sports festival. As he stepped out of the building and into the almost blinding light of the sun, Izuku could see a few figures standing on top of three separate podiums. On the third place podium stood Takoyami in dark shadow looking dark and mysterious as ever. On the second place podium stood Izuku's angry Pomeranian son, Katsuki. He looked disappointed and angry as always, but Izuku was incredibly proud of him for getting second place. And last but not least, standing on the first place podium, Shinzo. Izuku had never interacted with the lilac boy but from what he's seen of him, Shinzo always has a look of apathy spread across his features and bored, tired eyes. Izuku thought he and Aizawa were quite similar in that aspect. But now, the look of apathy was replaced by a proud smile. However faint it may be, a smile lopsided and dorky. It was one of the most delightful smiles Izuku has ever seen on a person. Too bad the boy didn't smile much. New quest, make Shinzo Hitoshi smile. To say that Katsuki was pissed would be an understatement. He had lost. He had lost to Ibegs. The stupid eraser had wannabe. Even after that extra Ajiro told him to not answer anything the purple-haired freak said, he couldn't stop himself. The extra got on his nerves. He pretty much made it his mission to make Katsuki angry. He got so angry he forgot the warning, which is how the mind control freak got into his head and did to Katsuki pretty much exactly what he did to Todoroki. Katsuki was so angry he, once again, didn't notice the big dog barreling towards him until it was too late and he was being crushed by the forest thing for the second time that day. Not again Izuku, get off. He yelled as he tried to shove the dog off him, but he didn't budge. And what's worse, the crowd, along with the teachers and his classmates, were all laughing and awing as the being they thought was an excitable dog tackled him down and pinned him to the ground. I swear, you're going to regret this. Katsuki's threat was cut short by a big paw landing directly on his face. What an asshole. Izuku sat on Katsuki's bed reading a book he couldn't be less interested in. The only thing that made the moment enjoyable was the glare he was receiving from the angry blonde sitting at the desk across the room. The corners of Izuku's mouth twitched up into a smug smile as he turned his attention to his kid. What's wrong, dynamite? Cat got your tongue. I'm gonna kill you. Was the only answer. An almost disturbingly calm answer. Haven't we had this conversation before? I'm pretty sure I've made it clear that you can't kill me. Well not on purpose. I actually thought I was gonna have a heart attack while watching you fight today. And I don't even know if I have a heart. 
Check my pulse. Izuku grabbed Katsuki's hand, holding to the spot on his neck where a pulse should be. Growling, Katsuki snatched his hand back from the forest thing, glaring harder now. I'm going to get you back for what you did at the sports festival. Izuku's grin widened. One could only describe it as shit-eating. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't do anything. With another growl, Katsuki runs at Izuku in an attempt to tackle him like the shorter had done to him twice within six hours, only for the forest thing to hop out of the way as if it were nothing. Katsuki may be fast, but Izuku is faster. Izuku looked down at the blonde, who is now laying on the bed after he attempted tackling him, and throws the blankets over him, pinning the blonde down, again. Katsuki needs to work on thinking things through before jumping in. Son of a bitch Katsuki glares from the bed, knowing he's been defeated, knowing from experience when Izuku has bested him. It's not wise to wrestle with the forest thing. The greenette smooths out the blankets, the same smug expression still plastered on his face. Incorrect. I don't have parents, I'm a son of no one. Smartass. Izuku just laughed softly, smiling widely with all his sharp teeth on display. Gosh, he loves this kid. Pro hero. Endeavor was taken into police custody yesterday for suspected domestic violence, among other things. And after being interrogated by detectives these suspicions were confirmed Izuku was laying on the couch, in dog form, next to Mitsuki as both of them watched the reporter on the TV. Izuku had managed to get that bastard put away, and he did it without violence. For the forest thing, this was a win and he couldn't help but silently celebrate. Masaru, have you seen the news this morning? Mitsuki questioned her husband who was cooking breakfast for the family. I can't believe a hero would do that to his family. What are you whining about, hag? Katsuki yelled as he stalked into the living room with his ever-present scowl plastered on his face. What a lovely child. Hey, brat Mitsuki completely ignored her son's bad attitude. Didn't you say one of your classmates was a Todoroki? Katsuki stopped and stared at his mom, his scowl faltering slightly as he caught the tail end of the news report about Endeavor that was still playing on the TV. Yeah, so what? Jeez, do you always have to yell? Izuku thought as he listened to Katsuki yell every time he spoke. Seriously, I'm surprised she hasn't. Smack. Stop yelling, brat. It's too early for your attitude. Don't hit me, hag. Never mind. Izuku sat beside Aizawa, who was cocooned in his yellow sleeping bag on the floor of the classroom after the teacher explained the internships to the class then let midnight take over. The forest thing happily watched all the students come up with their first hero code names while Aizawa idly pets his head and ears. All of the kids were so creative with their names. Izuku just hoped Katsuki didn't try the name he had come up with the last time he and Izuku talked about code names. I don't think Midnight will like King Explosion Murder that much. Izuku thought. He wasn't sure why the blonde was so adamant about the word murder being in his name, but the forest thing wasn't sure he wanted to know. He watched as Koda went back to his seat after sharing his name with the class. Izuku liked Koda. He was always so kind and quiet, the exact opposite of Katsuki. Besides Katsuki, his friends, and Shouto, Izuku had spent more time sitting with Koda than the rest of the class. Not that he didn't like the rest of the class. He loves all his kids, but Koda got anxious easily and because of his quirk, the comfort of an animal, or something that looks like an animal, helped calm him down. Everyone in the classroom watched expectantly as Katsuki stood up and walked to the front of the room, his whiteboard in hand. Izuku suspected the rest of the class was thinking something similar. What name did you come up with? Midnight asked eagerly. Katsuki looked back to glance at Izuku briefly before turning back to the class and holding up his whiteboard. Dynamite. Izuku felt the joy rising inside him and didn't notice as his wagging tail almost hit Aizawa in the face, earning a grunt from the teacher. That suits you so well. Midnight exclaimed while bouncing up and down on her feet. Though, her joy was nothing compared to what Izuku felt at that moment. Katsuki had picked one of the nicknames Izuku had been calling him for years and he picked it to be his hero name. The forest thing had to fight the strong urge to change forms and tackle Katsuki in a hug. It was a hard fight. Instead, Izuku followed Katsuki back to his desk and sat beside him with his tail still wagging. The blonde looked at his goofy dog and rolled his eyes, muttering a quiet, yeah, yeah, shut up, as he patted Izuku's head. Izuku stared at the screen of Katsuki's phone and watched as the messages flooded into the new group chat. The new group chat that was promptly named The Cult. Over the past few weeks, most of Class 1 has started bringing Izuku little gifts. Pretty rocks, unique coins, buttons, shiny things they find, etc. Izuku loved all the little things they brought for him. It reminded him of when the village people would bring him things before they were afraid of him. It didn't take long for some of the other classes to catch on and join the cult and it wasn't long after that when some of the teachers got involved as well. Now Izuku had met most of the school. The new group chat only had students from 1A and 1B, but even that was enough to start chaos and Katsuki hadn't even seen it yet. The forest thing didn't know how to feel about this. On one hand, he was sure this was just the kid's way of showing how much they loved him, and he was grateful for that. 
But on the other hand, this wasn't the first cult that has been made because of him. With how long he's been alive and just being how he is, before quirks, people used to act like he was a god when they found him. Even if Izuku knew this wasn't the same thing, he couldn't help but remember what those people did and how badly it ended. Zu, you're muttering again. Katsuki looked up from the book he was reading to see the green-haired being staring at his phone while muttering something he couldn't understand. Izuku shut off Katsuki's phone and set it on the desk beside him. Sorry, I just remembered something from a long time ago. When you say a long time ago, how long ago do you mean? Katsuki raised a questioning eyebrow. The forest thing ran his long fingers through his green curly hair, a few leaves falling onto the bedroom floor. A sometime before quirks, probably far before quirks. Being as old as Izuku is, memories start to blend together and it's hard to remember timelines sometimes. He couldn't remember whole decades, most likely because he used to sleep a lot. But if he thought hard enough he could remember when humans invented cars and computers. How old are you, anyway? It's gotta be over a thousand, right? Katsuki sat up and crossed his arms. Izuku let out something halfway between and laugh and a sigh before answering. Every time you ask something like that I give you the same answer, I don't remember. I've been around too long to remember when I came into existence. Don't you mean, to remember when you were born? Izuku shook his head, more leaves falling out of his green curls and landing on his lap. I wasn't born, or at least I don't think I was. Things like me aren't really born, you know. Katsuki's scowl deepened and Izuku felt confusion and frustration radiating off of him. What the fuck do you mean? How can you not be born? Everything is born, stupid. Katsuki shouted at him as if what he said personally offended him. To be fair, he had a point. Izuku was the only living being he knew of that wasn't born as far as he knew. But then again, he's never met another forest thing before. But if Izuku was born, that meant he had parents and he was pretty sure if he did have parents, he would remember them. At least he hoped he would remember them. To be born, you need to have parents, I don't have those. Though, now Izuku didn't sound so sure of himself. Anyway, how old I am, or how I am, isn't what I was muttering about. Izuku quickly changed the subject before he could be dragged down the rabbit hole that is his mind. Katsuki didn't seem very pleased about the change in topic. There was silence for a moment. Neither boy moved, both of them just staring at each other, waiting for the other to speak. Uh, Izuku started, breaking the heavy silence that filled the room. I think I just became the leader of a cult. Why are pro heroes such wet blankets? Katsuki was interning with the pro hero best genus and had all but begged the pro to let Izuku join him at the agency for the week. Even after Nezu himself told the man Izuku wouldn't get in the way, he still refused. Well, it's his loss anyway. Call Izuku a mangy mutt and see who's laughing when he can't get Katsuki to chill without the forest thing there to help. Even though Best Genus wasn't the only pro hero to deny a student to bring the forest thing with them to their internship, he was the only one who didn't have a good reason. He couldn't go with Tsu since she would be interning with an aquatic hero. It wasn't their fault they didn't know Izuku could transform into an aquatic animal. He couldn't go with Achako. Apparently, quite a few of Gunhead's other interns are allergic to animals. Iwabami would have let Momo bring him along but her modeling agency refused. Mount Lady offered him an invitation but Minda was still scared of the forest thing so that was off the table. Izuku was ready to accept defeat and was preparing for a quiet and boring weekend with Katsuki's parents. He didn't mind. Katsuki's parents were used to him being left at home whenever their son couldn't bring him somewhere. But the day before the internship started, it finally happened. Tenya approached him and Katsuki after class, informing them that the hero he was interning with, Manuel, had heard about all the students trying to convince multiple pros to let them bring a dog and decided he would invite Izuku to tag along with him and Ida for the internship week. As much as Tenya insisted that having a dog at a hero agency was highly unprofessional, Manuel insisted on meeting the UA cryptid he's heard about from the other pros that worked at the school. Izuku was just glad he could keep an eye on the young Ida child after hearing about what happened to his brother during the sports festival. That's how Izuku got here, laying on a couch in the lounge of the manual hero office in Hasu City. He and Tenya had been there for two days already and it was quite peaceful. There wasn't much crime in the city at the moment, which was good, so their morning and evening patrols were mostly just manual and Tenya making small talk with manual giving a lesson or a tip here and there. Izuku thought Tenya would be eager to learn about what pros did in their day-to-day, -day, but he just seemed distracted. No matter what happened or what manual said, Tenya was only half listening like he was always thinking about something else. It was very out of character for the teen since he was always the one to tell his classmates to pay attention in class. Izuku was starting to worry. What if a villain attacked and Tenya was too distracted? What if he got hurt? He couldn't let that happen. Izuku, we are going out for our evening patrol, are you joining us? Tenya asked from the doorway of the lounge, already dressed in his white armored hero costume. The forest thing lifted his head off the couch where he had been resting for most of the afternoon when he heard the teen calling out to him as he entered the room. 
He quickly got off the couch and trotted over to his kid and both of them made their way to the front of the agency where Manuel was already waiting for them. With a pat on the head from the pro hero, gosh he loves pats, the three set off on their evening patrol just as the sun started to dip below the horizon, making the sky turn all different shades of pinks and oranges, just like the day before. Manuel did most of the talking as they patrolled the quiet streets of Hasu City and Izuku notices that, once again, Tenya wasn't paying much attention to the man. The streets were quiet this evening, besides the few people who waved at Manuel, or the odd couple of people who spoke to Tenya after recognizing him from the sports festival and even some who stopped them to pet Izuku, everything was calm that evening. Calm and peaceful. But God must love to spite Izuku because as soon as the forest thing thought about how peaceful the city was, he felt the distress and panic of multiple people wash over him in a harsh wave, the feeling coming from just a few blocks away from them. Izuku barked loudly to get the attention of the pro and he noticed Tenya flinch beside him at the volume and the suddenness of the bark. What is it, boy? Manuel turned around to look at the dog then looked around to try and spot whatever the dog was barking at assuming it was a cat or a bird. Just as the forest thing was about to bark again, the strong scent of smoke filled his nose and drew his attention away from the pro who was looking at him with growing confusion. Izuku's eyes darted around, frantically searching for any sign of a fire or the disturbance he had sensed. His emerald green eyes spotted smoke rising above a building and had barely let out another bark before he was sprinting in that direction. It didn't take long for his two companions to see the fire as well and start to run after Izuku once they realized what was happening. As Izuku got closer to the fires he could hear civilians screaming and other pro heroes already fighting off something. Izuku turned the corner and immediately dodged a flying piece of rubble that was thrown in his direction. What is that? He heard Manuel shout from behind him. That's in Namu. Tenya shouted in response as he came to a stop next to Izuku. He could barely hear the two of them over the commotion going on in front of them. After analyzing the situation, Manuel turned to Tenya as he put his helmet on. Tenya, you have permission to use your quirk to evacuate civilians, get as many out as you can. The pro quickly gave orders to his intern before running off to join the other pros who were fighting the Nama. Izuku watched as the dark-haired teen blasted off towards the buildings with the help of his quirk. Hopefully, he doesn't get hurt, Izuku can't follow him around to protect him. Even though this Nama doesn't seem as strong as the one from the USJ, the handful of pros here couldn't handle it on their own, so Izuku needs to help. Unfortunately, in this situation, if he transformed into his natural form he might be mistaken for a Nama. Then the heroes will attack him as well, which also means he can't just eat the Nama like he did the first time since he has to stay in dog form. So with that in mind, Izuku ran into the fray, bearing his sharp teeth and ready to pounce on a Nama. The dog ran between the heroes, dodging and weaving through rubble and flying debris, waiting for his opening. Manuel opened a fire hydrant and began using the water from it to try and ease the fires around the area so the other heroes could get to the Namu, and also drenching the Namu in the process, which was the perfect distraction. Is that a dog? Izuku, what are you doing? What's a dog doing here? Izuku heard the pros yelling but he was too busy focusing on the Namu to care about what they were saying. The monster turned its back to the forest thing after it got hit by one of the pros, which gave Izuku the opening he needed to jump onto its back digging his sharp claws into the Namu's shoulders so he wouldn't fall off easily. The Namu let out a pained roar as the dog latched onto it and the beast started to thrash around in an attempt to shake the forest thing off its back. Izuku bit down on the Namu's shoulder, making it let out another deafening screech before grabbing Izuku and throwing him into a wall. The forest thing stumbled to his feet, noticing how all the panic and distress around him became overwhelming. His eyes could barely focus and he felt so, so dizzy. He needed to help the heroes in the fight but his senses were overloaded with the stress and panic that came from everyone around him. All he could feel was panic and fear from the civilians and the pros, unfamiliar panic and fear. He couldn't recognize a single person there, which made it all the more overwhelming. Izuku almost fell over as he was hit by yet another wave of emotion. He was sure he would have passed out, but this new person felt familiar. It felt just like the panic he sensed at the sports festival, just like the person he sensed having the panic attack, the person he never found. But that wasn't possible. None of his other kids were here right now. None of the pros who were at the festival were here, and Tenya is helping. Wait. Izuku looked around frantically but couldn't find any sign of his kid in the area. Shit. Izuku focused on the familiar person and ran as fast as he could. He knew it was risky to leave the fight with the Namo. But if Tenya was panicking then he was in danger. He followed his senses, running in the opposite direction from the fight, and found himself a few blocks away in a quieter part of the city. The further he got from the fight, the better his head felt. Izuku had never been around so many panicking people before and the experience was too much for him to handle, he wasn't used to it yet. He could still feel all of the panicking people in the distance, but now they were more like whispers instead of deafening screams. Izuku found himself navigating the network alleyways behind buildings, 
He could feel himself getting closer to Tenya. The kid's panic was getting stronger by the second and Izuku was silently cursing at the fact that he couldn't go faster. Then he heard voices. I'm ingenium, and I will defeat you. Tenya. Izuku ran faster towards the alley. Hopefully, he can get there before whoever Tenya is trying to defeat can hurt him. Then so be it came a darker voice, one Izuku couldn't recognize. Die. Izuku stopped at the mouth of the alley, still hidden in the shadows, and what he saw was a man wearing a ragged, red scarf and grey clothes, pushing a sword into Tenya's shoulder then licking the blade. He was hurting his kid. The forest thing let out a low growl as he stepped into the dim light of the alley, grabbing the attention of both Tenya and the unknown man standing above him. Who is this mutt? The man snarled at Izuku but kept his sword pointed at Tenya. Izuku, no. This is my fight. Tenya yelled at him, knowing full well Izuku wouldn't back off from this. Not after seeing the man stab his kid. Quiet. The man waved his sword at the teen paralyzed on the floor of the alley. The action made Izuku's blood boil. If he even had blood, he wasn't sure. Izuku was about to transform and eat this monster just like he had done to the Namu at the USJ. But the scene in front of him flooded his mind with memories of the forest. Memories of the man who hurt the little girl he was trying to protect. Memories of killing the man to save the child. Memories of everyone fearing him after he killed someone. No, that couldn't happen again. He has to think this through. This isn't a monster like the Namu. He can't just kill him. This is a human being and Tenya might not forgive Izuku if he killed someone in front of him. He can't kill this man, no matter how much he wants to. With his mind made up, Izuku stepped further into the alley. The sounds of bones snapping and changing echoed around the silent alley as the previous form of a dog rose into the form of a young teen. Izuku grabbed the man by his shirt and slammed him against the brick wall behind him. The man dropped his sword, but his expression didn't falter, yet. As crazy red eyes met glowing, toxic green, Izuku was silent. Another false hero, I see. I'll just have to kill you both. The man spoke with a crazed smile. That's what this was about. How dare this guy say his kid was a fake hero. Tenya worked just as hard, if not harder than most of the kids in his class. He would be an amazing hero. Izuku growled again. He could feel his hands shake with anger and was a little surprised that the man wasn't scared of him yet. He must have noticed Izuku's weird appearance already, but maybe he just didn't care. He almost forgot himself. He was so angry. He was two seconds away from killing his guy. Izuku wanted to rip him to shreds so badly. He wanted to make him pay for hurting his kid. As he was about to grab this ninja wannabe by the head and rip it off his shoulders, the forest thing hesitated. No, you can't. Not in front of Tenya. Izuku reminded himself. The hero killer let out a dark chuckle. He took Izuku's hesitance for weakness and in the few seconds while Izuku was thinking, he brought up a knife that he had hidden somewhere on his person and swiftly slashed the green across the face. Izuku brought his free hand up to touch his cheek where the knife cut him and looked down at the black substance on his fingers. The forest thing turned back to the man only to watch him lick the same black substance off his knife and smirk as he waited expectantly. After a few seconds, the hero killer's face morphed into an expression between confusion and fear. Izuku stared into the man's soul with his bright green eyes full of rage. His hands gripped the man's shirt so tightly his knuckles turned white and his dark claws began to ripe through the fabric. Don't kill, don't kill, don't kill, Izuku repeated in his mind. The man looked completely terrified now. Izuku pulled him away from the wall he had been pinned to. He pulled him so close their faces were only a few inches apart. The hero killer could feel the pure rage that radiated off the being that looked like a kid. But when he looked into the boy's toxic green eyes, he saw a being beyond a mere human. It terrified him. Don't. Touch. My. Kid. Izuku spoke with what sounded like many voices at once. He sounded like a demon. It sent a shiver down the hero killer's spine. Izuku slammed the man against the wall again. This time hard enough to knock him unconscious then threw him onto the ground. With Stain now unconscious, Tenya was finally able to move again and he immediately gripped the wound on his shoulder. The forest thing rushed to his side and helped him slowly sit up. If Tenya hadn't seen the boy transform with his own eyes, then he wouldn't have believed this was Izuku. Are you okay? Of course, you're not okay, you're hurt. What were you thinking, Tenya? Manuel told you to evacuate. I was so worried about you. Izuku rambled like a worried mother as he checked the teen for any other injuries. Itenya was about to make an excuse but he stopped himself. Knowing Izuku, he could probably smell lies and excuses. I'm sorry Tenya hung his head. All of the anger left inside Izuku melted away as he gently pulled the youngest Ida child closer to run his long finger through his dark hair. An affectionate action that the teen seemed to like. Let me look at that wound, then we'll go find the pros. Tenya nodded and let Izuku pull the armor off his shoulder to look at the wound. It was still bleeding, but it was slowing down now. Izuku brought his hands up to his viridian curls and started to ruffle his hair, leaves, and sticks falling onto the ground in front of him. Tenya watched with a confused expression. He had no idea what the forest thing was doing, or why. 
He had so many questions. Why were there seemingly endless leaves falling out of his hair? Why did he have hair? Wasn't he supposed to be a dog? Then a big green leaf fell out of Izuku's hair and he grabbed it quickly, using a part of his shirt to gently wipe the excess blood away from the wound, then placed the leaf over the wound itself. There, that should keep it clean until we can get you some proper medical attention. Izuku wiped his hands on his t-shirt then stood up. We should get going. The forest thing tried to lift the teen to his feet but Tenya was practically frozen in shock, trying to process everything that happened in the last 10 minutes. Izuku wrapped his arms around his kid, pulling him into a hug, which the teen immediately reciprocated. It's okay, I got you, you're safe. Izuku quietly murmured to his kid. It's been a while since he's had to comfort someone like this. You're a good hero, Izuku Tenya managed to say as he pulled away from the hug. The greenette smiled widely, the smile showcasing his many sharp teeth. I'm not a hero, I'm just a forest thing. Izuku pulled Tenya's uninjured arm over his shoulder gently before lifting him to stand. We should get going now. Manuel will be looking for us. Just as Izuku was helping Tenya stand, keeping the boy close to him, Manuel, along with a few other pros, stopped at the mouth of the alley. Tenya, is that stain? All Izuku could smell was smoke. There was fire burning all around him as he ran through the once safe and peaceful streets of Hasu City. Hasn't he done this before? He was sure he had. He remembered running through the streets just recently, but why? He didn't live in Hasu, so why was he here? Loud roars and deafening screams were all he could hear. He could feel the panic and distress from the people within the burning city. But it was different somehow, it was as if they weren't actually there. As if the panic Izuku was sensing wasn't coming from an external source. That can't be right. The forest thing ran down the street, barely noticing the fact that he was in human form instead of dog form. And as he turned a corner to go down a different street, the forest thing could only wish he were anywhere but here. As Izuku turned the corner he came to the horrifying scene of Anamu standing over the bodies of dead or dying pro heroes. Blood stained the ground that was littered with rubble and covered the bodies of the heroes in a thick layer of red. Izuku was frozen in place. He couldn't pry his eyes away from the scene in front of him, no matter how much he wanted to. A small movement caught Izuku's attention and he turned to see Manuel, barely alive, reaching towards him as if begging to be saved by the forest thing. But Izuku wasn't fast enough. Just as he was about to jump in to rescue the hero, the Namu stepped forward, crushing the man's skull with its large foot. Izuku's eyes widened in horror as he watched. He can't stay here. He couldn't watch anymore. He didn't want to. The forest thing felt his own panic rising within him. His hands felt sweaty. Could he even sweat? His heart was beating so loud he thought it would deafen him. Did he even have a heart? He just turned around and ran. This couldn't be happening. He remembers this going differently. He remembers helping the heroes and saving Tenya. Was that not real? Was Tenya still in danger? The thoughts made Izuku run faster. He needed to find his kid. He already failed the heroes. He wouldn't fail Tenya as well. Izuku ran down the streets, frantically looking for the right alleyway, the one he had found Tenya and Stain in before. He could hear his own heart beating within his chest and feel his hands shake at his sides as he ran. He hasn't panicked like this for decades. And the dark, crazed laugh coming from the alley only made it worse. For the second time that night, Izuku rounded the corner, coming to the mouth of the alley, and what he saw broke him. Stain stood over the unmoving, bloody body of the young hero student. His sword was covered in the boy's blood and he was rambling on and on about false heroes. Then he turned around, looking at Izuku as if he knew the forest thing had been there. But that wasn't possible. Stain didn't know he was coming, he didn't know he existed. You're too late, Izuku. Stain smiled widely as Izuku fell to his knees by Tenya's side, holding the boy close and checking his pulse. Nothing. And no no. Why? Izuku screamed as he held Tenya's limp body in his arms. He looked up towards where Stain was standing behind him. But when he made eye contact with the man, his body began to morph into something else. Soon, Stain was no longer standing there. Now, he was looking into the red eyes of the kid he had adopted years ago. Now Katsuki was standing in front of him. His normal scowl was gone, replaced by a look of disgust and disappointment. You failed. How can you protect me when you can't even save him or the heroes? Adults try to teach children that words don't hurt. That sticks and stones may break my bones and all that, but this hurt. It hurt so much, Izuku thought he was dying. I should have left you in that forest. No wonder those people from the village hated you. K cats, don't say that, Izuku choked back a sob, I tried to save them. I I just wasn't fast enough. Pathetic, Katsuki scowls. The alley around him turned dark and his surroundings started to change. The brick walls of the buildings turned to trees, the pavement turned to dirt and grass. Izuku was back in the forest. Katsuki and Tenya were gone, along with the city of Hasu, and Izuku was left in the darkness of the place that was once his home, turned to a prison. The darkness didn't last long though. Soon he could hear yelling, and see light as a large group of people approached him. 
Some held pitchforks and torches, some held bows and spears, others had guns, and a few just had their quirks. It was a horrible mix of history and all of them were after Izuku. The greenette stood up quickly and began to run through the dark forest. If this was the same forest he had stayed in for all those years, which he was sure it was, then the cave he used as a home should be somewhere close by. Izuku ran as fast as he could away from the mod of people, silently looking up at the bright moon as it illuminated his path through the forest. He looked at the moon as if it were an old friend, as if he were asking it to save him. But it was just the moon. It couldn't do much. Izuku looked forward again. He was still running towards his cave. The only place he knew was safe, but his path was blocked by another mob of people. He skidded to a stop in front of them and looked around frantically for an escape but soon he was surrounded. Some people he recognized as people from the village, people from his past, but others were more familiar. He could easily see Shadow and Denki within the crowd of people. All he could hear were their insults and harsh words, each person calling him a monster in one way or another. Izuku fell to his knees with his hands over his ears, his long fingers tangled into his viridian curls. The crowd of people got closer and closer until they were standing almost on top of him. All he could see was the angry and disgusted expressions of the people he had failed. No longer could he see the beautiful silver moon. Izuku fell into the dirt and everything went dark. Everything went quiet. Izuku woke up from his nightmare suddenly and almost jumped to his feet as soon as his eyes opened. It took a moment for him to collect himself, but when he did he found himself in Katsuki's bedroom. It was still dark outside, so it was most likely the middle of the night, but at least he wasn't back in that forest. The forest thing pulled himself off the floor where he had been sleeping next to Katsuki's bed in dog form and quietly walked over to the sleeping teen, standing beside the bed and resting his head on the mattress gently. He didn't want to get too close in case Katsuki was actually mad at him like he had been in his dream, but just being close to the boy brought Izuku some comfort. Izuku stood quietly by the bed, his head resting next to the sleeping blonde's shoulder, and he tried to relax. He didn't dare close his eyes though. If he did then he would probably see something he didn't want to. It didn't take long for the forest thing's presence to wake up the teen. He didn't mean to wake him up, but just being there and looking at him was enough. Katsuki's crimson eyes opened slowly and he groaned. He looked at Izuku for a moment, probably waiting for the forest thing to do something, but he only stared at the blonde with his big green eyes. What? Katsuki whispers, turning over in his bed to look at Izuku better. What do you want? Izuku let himself transform into his human form, not moving his head from where he was resting his chin on Katsuki's bed. He didn't actually know how to answer the question though. What did he want? Well, comfort was one of the things he wanted. But he was supposed to be the big strong protector. He couldn't go cowering to his kid every time he had a bad dream. Is Tenya okay? He asked quietly, tilting his head to the left slightly. He still wasn't sure if what happened in his dream was real or not. So this was probably the best way to find out without telling Katsuki he had a nightmare. Four eyes. Yeah, he's fine. Katsuki sat up and rubbed the sleep out of his eyes. He glanced at the clock by his bed, noting that it was 3.34 a.m. Why? Did you have a nightmare or something? Busted. Was it really that obvious? Or did Katsuki just know him that well? Well and no. No, go back to sleep, Kaken. Izuku dismissed, shaking his head softly as he lifted it from the bed. Katsuki grunted softly and Izuku could almost hear him rolling his eyes. Bullshit. He scoots closer to the other side of the bed. Get up here, idiot. Izuku stared at him for a moment before getting up and slowly getting into the bed next to him and laying down. Katsuki laid down again, this time pulling the blanket over them and throwing an arm over Izuku. Genite, Zu, Katsuki mutters as he lays his head down on Izuku's shoulder like he's done so many times in the past. Izuku leans into the touch, gently combing his long fingers through Katsuki's blonde hair as the boy falls asleep again. Izuku wraps his arms tightly around the blonde and sighs contently, Good night, dynamite. The being disguised as a fly gently landed on a wooden bench in the corner of a park, lit only by the light of the moon above him. He looked around for a moment to be sure he wasn't being watched before the forest thing turned to his humanoid form. Izuku didn't usually go out at night. Most nights he would be at the Bakugu residence, sleeping alongside Katsuki. But these past few nights have been different, ever since Endeavor was arrested. Izuku has been paying more attention to the students. Well, more than he usually did anyway. In the best case scenario, Shadow was the only student who needed help with their home situation. Worst case scenario Izuku doesn't want to think about that. With the final exams finished and summer break started, the students have been at home a lot more. What better time to do some secret house checks? And no, Izuku isn't stalking these kids. Okay, maybe he is a little, but he's just trying to make sure his kids are safe. What kind of guardian would he be if he let his kids stay in unsafe homes? Fortunately, over these last few days of investigation, Izuku hasn't had to report any more bad parents. Honestly, he was thankful. He didn't want any of his kids to suffer the way the Todoroki kids had. 
Izuku looked down at the wrinkled paper he held, a list of student names and addresses, a little checkmark next to the name of every student he's checked in on so far and the only one left on the list was Shinso. At first, Izuku thought getting the addresses of students would be difficult. He thought he would have to sneak into UA to snoop through their records, or something. But after a quick chat with Principal Nezu, the rat being happily helped the forest thing with his quest to make sure all the problem children were safe at home. Izuku wasn't surprised by Nezu anymore. The last one on the list is Hitoshi. Izuku muttered to himself as he double and triple checked the list to make sure he hadn't forgotten anyone. It's only half past one so I should have time to check in and be back in Katsuki's room before he wakes up. With a plan in mind, the forest thing folded the paper up and slid it into the pocket of his old, worn pants. He pushes himself off the park bench, leaves falling from his messy, green hair as he moves, then he changes to a fly again. And if you're going to ask where the paper goes when he transforms, then don't bother, Izuku doesn't know either. Izuku was quite surprised to find out that Hitoshi was in foster care, though he could easily guess why it still made him sad. The fact that he was born with a quirk that most would describe as villainous wasn't his fault, and the fact that someone gave up such a strong, determined kid, it made Izuku angry. He didn't know Hitoshi that well, but from the interactions he has had with the boy over the past few months, Izuku can tell he's a good kid. Despite the apathetic tone, the bored expression, and the eye bags that remind him of Aizawa, he could tell that Hitoshi cared and he could tell how much it hurt the kid when someone told him he was a villain. Izuku could relate in a way. But this isn't about Izuku. He needs to stay focused on the task at hand. He needs to find the right house and he needs to make sure his kid is okay. As Izuku approached the house, he noticed that all the lights were out beside one and as he got closer to the lit window, he noted that it was a bedroom, if you could call it that. It looked more like a jail cell, without the toilet of course. Uncomfortable mattress, uncomfortable pillow, old grey sheets, and a wardrobe that looked like it was as old as Izuku. On the bed, idly scrolling on his phone, was the exact lilac-haired boy Izuku had come to see. Why is he awake? It's almost two in the morning, Izuku thought as he flew in through the open window. The forest thing got closer to the teen on the bed, trying to be at least a little stealthy. He didn't want Hitoshi to see him, even if he was a fly. Izuku touched down on the wall next to Hitoshi's bed and took in the boy's appearance. The same gravity-defying hair, the same eye bags, the same bored express weight. How had he not noticed the thing mask? On his face, a dark, seemingly metal, mask that covers the lower part of his face. Hitoshi dropped his phone on the bed next to him and reached his hand up to his face, scratching at the edge of the mask with a pained hiss. That's when it clicked. This isn't just a mask like the one Shoji wears. And it isn't the kind of mask you wear when you're sick either. It's a muzzle. Shouta just wants a simple life, but of course, he can't have that. He has jobs, responsibilities, and so many problem children. He was looking forward to a nice quiet night off. An entire evening of relaxing in his sleeping bag with a thermos of coffee and his cats. What could be better? Honestly, he's still tired from the final exams and they happened three days ago. And Hizashi yelling at him every chance he gets doesn't help Shouta feel less tired. There are so many loud blondes at the school this year. Shouta didn't think someone could be almost as loud and obnoxious as Hizashi until he met Bakugu. Don't even get him started on Kaminari. Don't get him wrong. He doesn't hate his students, but all of them are problem children. Shouta was just happy he could finally relax. The tired man was just crawling into his sleeping bag when there was a knock on his door. Shouta groans and rubs his temples as he feels the beginning of a headache. He pulls himself away from his nice, warm sleeping bag and walks over to the door, looking through the peephole. On the other side of the peephole, Shouta could see a bright green eye looking right back at him, like something from a horror movie. It didn't scare him. He's seen scarier things as an underground hero, but he would admit that it was weird. Shouta unlocks the door and pulls it open immediately making eye contact with familiar green eyes, eyes that belong to one of UAS newest cryptids, and he's standing on Shouta's doorstep. Shouta, we need to talk. The young-looking boy blurts before the tired teacher could ask what he's doing at his house in the middle of the night, but if he's here so late then it's probably really important. Shouta sighs and begrudgingly steps aside so the eldritch being can enter his apartment. Students don't call me Shouta. The greenette walks into the apartment, his viridian curls bouncing with every step and the occasional leaf falling out. Then it's a good thing I'm not one of your students, huh? Plus, I'm at least five centuries older than you. So the forest thing shrugs as he turns to look at Shouta. As much as Shouta didn't believe Izuku when he spoke about how old he was, the man had to admit that there was something in the boy's eyes that made him want to believe it. No matter how many times he looks into Izuku's eyes, it's never like looking at a teenager. Beneath the friendly. Wide eyes is something Shouta couldn't name because he doesn't know what it is. Sometimes it's easy to forget that this human-like being isn't human. Sometimes it's easy to forget he isn't another problem child in Shouta's class. He can already tell this was going to be a long night. Shouta stared at the being in front of him, 
The being that looked like some dirty homeless kid with big eyes and fluffy hair at first glance. But the longer you look, the more you notice. Shouta couldn't believe what he was hearing. Stop. Let me get this straight. He began before drinking the rest of the cold coffee in his mug. You were the one who convinced Nezu to look into Endeavor. Izuku nodded. And after that, you decided it was a good idea to find out where all my students live, so you could sneak into their houses without them knowing, in the middle of the night, to make sure they were okay. Once again, Izuku nodded. Then he tilted his head in a questioning manner. It was strange to think this kid isn't actually a kid. He looked like he could be one of Shouta's students. It was sometimes hard to not treat him like one. That's exactly what happened. Why do you seem so confused? Shouta couldn't hold back the groan after hearing Izuku's question. He raised his hands to rub his head, trying to banish the headache he knew was coming, but he knew it would only help for so long. For someone who claims to be an extremely old, immortal being, you're quite dense. Izuku furrowed his eyebrows as if he were almost offended by what Shouta had said. Well people didn't really like me, and I was alone for a very long time. Izuku glanced away for a second before making eye contact with Shouta again. He swore he could see a flicker of sadness in his emerald green eyes before it was quickly blinked away. But I think you're missing the point. There was a point to this visit. The teacher asked dryly with one of his eyebrows raised. Yes, the greenette exclaimed, throwing his arms into the air in over-exaggerated exasperation. Gosh, I need to stop going on tangents when there are more important topics. Shouta stood and walked over to the coffee machine to make the next and not the last cup of coffee that night. In the corner of his vision, he could see Izuku brushing his long fingers through his messy green hair and Shouta had to resist the urge to groan again when he saw the many leaves and small sticks falling onto the floor. I finished checking in on all the students just before I came here. All of them were fine until I got to the last house. Izuku spoke shockingly fast. Shouta was almost glad he was so used to talking to Hazashi, or else he probably wouldn't be able to keep up. I got to Hitoshi's house. He was the last one on the list since it was difficult to get his address because he's in foster care. Did you know he was in foster care? You probably did, you. Kid, what is the point? Shouta snapped. He probably should have tried to be calmer, but it's almost 3 a.m. They put a muzzle on him to stop him from using his quirk or to just stop him from talking in general. It looked painful, too. Shouta almost dropped his fresh mug of coffee as the words processed in his mind. I thought about just taking him immediately, but that sounded a little too illegal. The tired hero drank all of the steaming coffee in his mug in one breath, set the mug down, tied his long, black hair into a loose bun, then sat down across from the cryptid again. The training camp starts tomorrow. I'll inform Nedzu of your discovery, assuming he doesn't already know, and he can arrange an investigation while Shinsu is out of the house. Shouta spoke calmly, but from the way Izuku was looking at him, the greenette somehow knew how angry he was. And you won't do anything impulsive. Got it. Izuku let out a huff, rolling his eyes as he rests his chin on his hand. Fine, fine. I won't do anything impulsive. But you have to promise that he'll be okay, or else I'm getting involved. The grunt Shouta gave in response was enough for the freckled being as he stood up and started walking to the door. Great, I got to get home to my kid, you know how Katsuki is. Imagine what would happen if he woke up and I wasn't there. Izuku giggled quietly, probably imagining the explosive teen in that exact scenario. I'll see you at the camp, Shouta. Don't call me that. Shouta glares but it was too late since Izuku was already running out the door, giggling like a child. Ignoring Izuku calling Bakugo his kid, as if he had adopted the kid and has been raising him for years, Shouta opens his laptop. Unsurprisingly, he already has a message from Nezu about Shinsu and the investigation. The bus ride to the training camp was long. Izuku didn't know where they were going exactly, but he knew it was in a forest somewhere. He just hoped it wasn't the forest, he probably wouldn't be able to handle that. While the bus ride was long, it wasn't boring. Who knew putting 20 super-powered teenagers on a single bus with only one? very tired, teacher, would be so entertaining. The forest thing had predicted the chaos and sat next to Hitoshi on the bus, leaving plenty of space between them and the inevitable shenanigans that were bound to happen, but close enough that he could step in if things got out of hand, or if Minda decided to cause trouble again. There was surprisingly less chaos than Izuku had expected, but Aizawa was watching and he already had an annoyed expression, so he assumed that was why there weren't explosions flying everywhere already. What was even more surprising was how little Katsuki's quirk was popping, considering the situation. Denki and Ijiro had somehow convinced Katsuki to take a which pro hero are you quiz. Don't ask how, Izuku has no idea how they managed. The forest thing probably wouldn't have been able to convince the blonde to do that in front of all his friends. But somehow they did. Needless to say, Katsuki wasn't very happy when he finished and it said, in big, bold letters, present Mike. Nobody could stop themselves from laughing. Izuku even heard Hitoshi quietly laughing beside him and he swears he saw Aizawa smirking. But who could blame them? It was pretty funny. If dogs could laugh, Izuku would be dying. 
Aizawa stood at the front of the bus as it came to a stop at the side of the road. The forest thing couldn't help but wonder what the teacher had planned since they were suspiciously parked on a cliff, not at the camp. The tired teacher walked off the bus and waited for all the students to walk off and stand together. He started talking about something but Izuku wasn't paying much attention to it. Instead, he was watching the young boy who was standing quietly beside two of the wild, wild pussycats as they introduced themselves. The forest thing left Hitoshi's side and trotted over to the little boy standing near the cat-themed heroes. He wore a red hat with golden horns on the front, brown hair peeking out from underneath it. He reminded Izuku of Katsuki due to the scowl he wore on his face at all times. It made him wonder if he was just like that, like Katsuki, or if something had happened to make him so angry. Maybe he could ask later. Izuku sat down in front of the young boy, staring at him with his wide, green eyes. The kid looked past Izuku at the heroes and the hero students, scowl growing before looking back at Izuku. His expression softened slightly as he reached out to pet the dog and Izuku gladly accepted the pets. After some pets, he gently grabbed the tag hanging from Izuku's collar. He didn't really need the collar, but he wore it when they left the house to make him seem more dog-like. Izuku, he read the tag out loud. The forest thing perked up at his name being said. And Koda, Izuku turned just in time to see all the students get flung off the mountain and into the forest below, each of them screaming or shouting something at their teacher who had pretty much betrayed them. Almost immediately he could feel the distress coming from the students, even if they were quite far away now, being thrown off the cliff and all. But as if he heard Izuku's worried thoughts, Aizawa turned to him, amused smirk hidden in his capture weapon, and gestured to the bus but the road. They'll be fine, Izuku. This is a test. Get back on the bus. With one last glance at the cliff all the students had been thrown over, Izuku trotted back over to the bus, Kota following closely behind him. He trusts Shouta, he wouldn't get the kids hurt on purpose. Izuku spends the rest of the drive to the camp, sitting with Kota as the boy spoke quietly about random things that crossed his mind. The forest thing found it strange how much people would rather talk to animals and pets about things than they would to other people. Every once in a while Izuku's fur would stand up and his skin would crawl, a feeling he usually only got when his senses were trying to warn him about something. It made him uneasy. He tried to shake his thoughts of worry from his mind, but no matter how many times he reminded himself of Aizawa's words, he just couldn't help but feel like something was wrong. Izuku, Aizawa called as they walked into the pussycat's house. I need to speak with you. As Izuku trotted over to the underground hero, the pussycats looked a little unsure. They had been told that Izuku wasn't actually a dog, of course, but they had never seen Izuku in any form but dog, so they weren't certain if Nenzu and Aizawa were being serious when they told the pussycats about the immortal eldritch forest creature they would be bringing along to the camp. Though, they also weren't certain if Aizawa was one to joke at all about these things. Aizawa gestures for Izuku to follow and the two walk down a hallway. The forest thing thought the house and the property were nice. It was big and pretty fancy, but it was homey and cozy. Izuku had been to fancy places before and they weren't exactly the type of place he fit in. Needless to say, he felt a little out of place whenever he went to Momo's home. The teacher stopped and turned back to Izuku. The forest thing couldn't read his expression and he was starting to wonder if the man was plotting something. As my teaching assistant, while we are here, I want you to go into the forest and help teach now the man was smiling and Izuku could only wonder if people felt this uneasy when he smiled as well. The forest thing has been told his smile is a little creepy, and make sure they don't kill each other or get lost. Now that, that is something Izuku can do. Helping lost kids find their way back to safety from the middle of a forest is something the forest thing is somewhat of an expert in and so what if he gets to mess with them a little on the way? Izuku immediately jumped into action running out the front door again and heading straight for the forest where his kids were already fighting dust monsters. Sometimes he forgets the feeling of being in a forest. How just being in a forest makes him stronger, faster, more alert. Within seconds the forest thing is running full speed through the forest, haphazardly jumping on trees, rocks, and logs. He was so lost in the incredible feeling of running through nature, he only realized he was at his destination when he heard Katsuki scream die. Target acquired. The angry teen exploded a dust monster with his quirk unaware of the new threat creeping in the bushes of the forest. As Katsuki hits the ground again after boosting himself up with his quirk, Izuku pounces. He jumps out of the bushes and within a blink of an eye he's grabbed Katsuki by the back of his shirt with his teeth, dragging him back into a bush. Izuku changes to his human form, continuing to drag Katsuki into the bushes, his kid thrashing and screaming the whole time. The forest thing wondered why none of his classmates were coming to help. Boo, Izuku said as he dropped the blonde on the ground and leaned over him with an almost manic grin. Damn it, Deku. I should have fucking known. Katsuki screamed as he jumped to his feet, glaring at his eldritch parent who couldn't stop laughing. What are you doing here? Izuku manages to stop his laughing. 
clearing his throat and trying to not burst into a fit of giggles. He answers, I'm the teaching assistant. His grin was wide and his sharp teeth sparkled in the small amount of sun that broke through the trees above them. Don't get lost. I'm gonna go see Shouto and mess with the rest of the class. See ya. And with that, Izuku ran off. With the power up from the forest, he was just a green blur when he ran so he didn't have to worry about the other students seeing him unless he stopped moving. The forest thing ran around the battlefield, dodging tape, acid, and occasionally Tenya when he zoomed around. He was fast enough that when he crossed paths with Izuku they could wave to each other before they both ran in different direction. As much as he wanted to just run around hugging all of them. Now wasn't the time, not when they are fighting dust monsters and trying to not get lost. It also just didn't feel like the right time to reveal himself. So Izuku runs past all the students, headed for the ice he can see being formed to impale one of the dust creatures. The thing hits the ground and breaks apart with a dusty poof, leaving only ice behind. The forest thing skids to a stop beside Shouto, catching the attention of the heterochromatic boy. Nice job with the ice, show. Izuku smiles, but I think you need to practice using both sides of your quirk, don't you? I will not use my father's quirk, Shouto responded quickly. Shouto Izuku begins as he throws an arm over the teen's shoulders, despite being shorter than him. That burning dumpster fire may have been your father but let's be honest, he was the worst. Izuku sees Shouto smile slightly and almost laugh at his words, causing him to smile as well. Endeavor is no longer in control of everything you do. This is your chance to take back your life and become a hero you can be proud of, using your quirk. Shouto looked at Izuku with wide eyes, as if the forest thing had said something amazingly profound. Izuku smiled at him again, and if it makes you feel a little better, I'll be your dad. Shouto's lips pull up into a smile and he laughs softly. Izuku didn't actually plan on having this kind of talk with Shouto in this kind of situation, but it's better late than never. He is the teacher's assistant. After all, gotta help teach. Just think about it. Izuku ruffles Shouto's hair then runs off again. Time to cause some trouble. With some help from Izuku. All the students made it to the camp just before sunset. Granted, they were meant to be there hours ago, but the pussycats admitted they overestimated the students' abilities when it came to fighting their way through the forest. But despite his students being late, Aizawa had to hide a smirk in his capture scarf when the students arrived, complaining about the forest being against them. Izuku trotted alongside the class in his dog form, looking all too pleased with himself while the students all looked two seconds away from collapsing. Though, their energy seemed to come back at the mention of food. The students crowded around the table, eating the food as if they hadn't eaten for a week. Izuku quickly snuck his way under the table where a few students would slip him some food when they thought their teacher wasn't watching. As the kids ate, some energy returned to them and they soon settled into conversation. Being a forest creature, Izuku doesn't need to eat every day. He's slept for years at a time without eating. But that doesn't mean he can't like food. Izuku crawls under the table, past the legs of the students and only somewhat listens to their conversations. As they conversed, they stopped handing food to Izuku, which is a problem because he's still hungry and the food was really good, so he's looking for someone who will give him more food. Of course, his first choice is Katsuki, so he sneaks over to the explosive blonde and gently nudges his legs with his nose. Katsuki pauses his conversation with Aijiro to look down at Izuku then promptly kicks him, saying, My food? Fuck off. Izuku huffs and makes a note to get revenge on Katsuki later before he goes to find someone else. The forest thing walks down the table, thinking about who might feed him if he asked and his eyes land on Ajiro. Ajiro would share, right. Once again Izuku sneaks over to the blonde and bumps him gently with his nose. Ajiro looks down at Izuku and smiles at him. For a moment, Izuku was hopeful, then. I don't know much about dogs, but I'm pretty sure you aren't meant to feed them from your plate. Ajiro reaches down, petting Izuku's head then returns to his conversation with Shoji. Well, Izuku can't argue with that. Maybe he should go bite Katsuki's ankles until he shares his food, or maybe Shouto or Tenya might give him some. Though, something tells him the answer he'd get from Shouto and Tenya would be similar to the answer he got from Ajira. Izuku grumbles quietly as he looks around the students again. He gets the feeling most of them will give him similar answers to Katsuki and Ajira. Then he hears quiet whistles between someone whispering his name, the voice belonging to Denki. The forest thing quickly makes his way over to yet another blonde, but this time he's greeted with a piece of beef. He wags his tail, gently taking the beef from Denki and resting his head on the teen's lap. Both Denki and Mina coo at him, commenting on how cute he is, then start talking about some animated show both of them have been watching, giving Izuku some more food now and then. And if Izuku thought about going home with Denki instead of Katsuki after the camp was finished, then nobody has to know. Something didn't feel right. Class 1A and 1B, along with Izuku, had been at the forest camp for three days already and everything was fairly normal. Well, what Izuku assumed was normal for a secret summer camp for super-powered teenagers. Yet, the forest thing couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. 
Maybe it's just strange to be back in the middle of a forest. Yeah, that's probably it. Nobody besides the pussycats, the teachers, the classes, and Principal Nedzu knew where the camp was, so nothing would go wrong. Nothing could go wrong, right? Although, the USJ incident does prove that villains have been able to steal information from the school in the past should he talk to Aizawa about this. No, the man is busy enough already. Izuku shouldn't stress him out more than he already is. Oi, Deku. Katsuki shouted, forcefully yanking Izuku from his thoughts. Get up, you lazy old man. The hobo said we're playing a dumb game tonight. Izuku huffs in annoyance at being called old. He isn't old. Okay, maybe he's old. But he definitely doesn't look old. The forest thing trots over to the explosive teen and the two go to join the rest of Class 1A, as well as Class 1B outside where they await instructions for the game from Pixie Bob and Ragdoll. If it was anything like the other fun things Aizawa plans, it would be interesting, to say the least. As they approached the group, Izuku could sense a strong mix of emotions coming from the team. Most of them were excited and eager to find out what game they would be playing, while others seemed more anxious. Then there were the few who were either indifferent or just too tired from training all day to care. I wonder what the game is going to be, Sue says as she, Achako, Jiru, and Momo joined the rest of the students as well. Aren't you scared, Sue? Mr. Aizawa planned this. It's probably not going to be a fun game. Achako bounces around slightly in an attempt to shake off her anxiety as she shouts. I just hope I'm on Yeyarazu's team. Minda drools as he attempts to stand by the dark-haired girl's side, making the girl look slightly uncomfortable until he's grabbed and dragged away by Shouji. Izuku snarls slightly as he watches the small, purple student, who, when he saw the forest thing, retreated to hide behind the multi-armed student. Izuku will have to thank Mezu for dealing with Minta later. Once the two pussycats arrived and started to explain what the game was, something about both classes taking turns to scare each other, Izuku couldn't help but look around, feeling like he was being watched by something. Something close by. The feeling made his skin crawl in a weird way. He was used to people staring at him or giving him weird looks. So it couldn't be any of the students. No, this was different. It felt bad. No way. Screw Icy Hot. I'll take Deku with me. Katsuki, once again, pulled Izuku from his thoughts with this shouting. Izuku quickly zoned back in on the situation as Pixie Bob told Katsuki he had to be paired with Shouto in the test of courage even if Izuku did accompany the two, which Katsuki was not happy about. The forest thing had no idea why he hated Shouto so much, but for some reason, he did. With Katsuki quietly pouting. 1B went into the forest to take their places while everyone in 1A stood with their teammate, waiting for their turn to take the test of courage. As teams started to enter the forest, Izuku could already sense the distress. Things like this always messed with his head. When his kids were scared or distressed and he couldn't help, it was one of the worst feelings. Even if this was just a game, even if there was a difference between actual fear and the fear you get when playing a scary game or when you get startled by something harmless, it made him feel more uneasy than he already was. Team 2, you're up. Pixie Bob made eye contact with Katsuki as he glared at her, giving him a smile in return which only made the blonde more grumpy as he walked into the forest with Shouto and Izuku. The boys didn't talk to each other as they walked and besides the screams from the teams ahead of them, the forest was mostly quiet, unsettlingly quiet. It made the feeling of being watched ten times worse. And somewhat unsurprisingly, Shouto and Katsuki weren't easy for the students of Class 1B to scare. Though, Izuku was pretty amused by their confusion when a girl, Yui Kodai, if he remembered correctly, popped her head out of the ground in front of them. Other than that, Katsuki just yelled at or insulted the students who tried to scare them, and yet they still wonder why some people, especially Monoma, don't like 1A. It wasn't all bad, though. Despite all of the bad memories Izuku has from being in forests, he has almost as many good ones, and he naturally just feels at home in wooded areas. So as they walked, Izuku was enjoying the nighttime forest stroll with his kids. They couldn't see the sky very well through the trees, but the forest thing knew it looked beautiful and everything around them smelled like nature. The forest thing took a deep breath, taking in the smell of grass, trees, flowers, nighttime air, and smoke weight, smoke. Izuku stopped in his tracks and sniffed the air and once again, he smelled smoke and something else, something he's never smelled before. Then his senses started going off. Distress was coming from all around him, real distress this time. By now, Katsuki and Shouto had stopped walking to look back at Izuku who couldn't help the loud bark that escaped him as a wave of fear crashed into him. He didn't recognize this person, but he knew who it was and he knew they were in danger. Izuku was about to take off running when he remembered he had two of his kids with him who might need protection if the camp really was under attack. As he turned around, his green eyes met red and without speaking, Katsuki knew what Izuku was saying. We're fine, idiot. Go take care of everyone else. He shouted and the forest thing hesitantly turned away from his two kids and ran off into the forest. He didn't know for sure if the camp was being attacked, but he could never ignore his senses when they told him someone was in danger and he never will. 
Izuku ran through the trees as fast as he could, using the power up from being in the forest to push himself to go faster and faster. As much as he didn't want to leave the students alone, he had to face the fact that they were hero students, training to be heroes so they could purposefully run into dangerous situations. They could protect themselves. Soon he reached a cliff, but he didn't stop running. Not when he could hear Koda's cries as someone who sounded like an adult man yelled at him. Izuku didn't care about what he was saying. All he could think about was tearing this person to shreds. Izuku turned the corner to see a tall, muscular man walking towards Koda, getting ready to crush the small child with his fist. He didn't hesitate. Izuku didn't even realize he had moved until he was standing between Koda and the villain, growling and baring his teeth as any angry dog would. What's this? Looks like I'll just have to kill your little doggy too. The man laughed. Izuku barked and growled but it only made him laugh louder. Koda jumped up and wrapped his arms around Izuku, a few of his tears falling onto the forest thing's fur. Don't hurt him. The man didn't stop laughing as he pulled his fist back to punch and what looked like muscle fibers crawled out of his skin and wrapped around his already big arms. As he brought his fist down, Izuku transformed, catching the super-powered punch with his now humanoid hands. The punch made contact with his chest and he skid backward slightly with Koda holding onto his waist. But it wasn't anything Izuku couldn't handle and he didn't waste any time before digging his claw-like fingernails deep into the man's arm. The man ripped his now bleeding arm away from the forest thing and stared at him with wide eyes as if he didn't expect the dog to transform into what looked like a teenager, and especially didn't expect that teenager to catch his punch. You've just made an enemy, Izuku growls. As soon as Izuku started barking, Katsuki knew something was wrong. You don't spend most of your life with someone, especially someone like Izuku who reacts so strongly to emotion, without picking up on things. If he were being honest, the sudden barking startled him, but he would never admit that to anyone. Izuku usually didn't bark unless he was protecting someone or sending a warning. The first time he had heard the forest thing bark was when he was eight years old. One of his friends was playing too rough as Izuku says and had pushed him off a big log while they were playing heroes. Izuku was standing over top of him and barking at the kid within a blink of an eye and the kid ran home crying. After that, they didn't play together when Izuku was around, but Izuku was always around. But back to the situation at hand. Izuku ran off to find the person in danger and Katsuki was left with icy hot. He was pretty sure they were being attacked and by the look the half and half bastard was giving him, he had come to the same conclusion. Katsuki stayed vigilant as he stalked through the forest in search of any disruptions, Todoroki following slightly behind him. It didn't take long for the forest to fall into chaos as students were attacked by villains and trees burned with cyan fire. They tried to keep ahead of the flames as they made their way down the forest path that not 20 minutes ago was set up for the hero students of UA to play a game. What was Izuku doing right now? Was he helping Aizawa? Eating villains? Desperately trying to save as many students as possible? Or could he possibly be hurt? He knew it was a stupid thought, to think Izuku would be hurt. The blonde had seen the forest thing fall out of trees, get hit by cars, fight off anything that threatened his kids, and even get hit by some of Katsuki's explosions. No matter what, he was always okay. No matter what, he always got back up. While he was uselessly worrying about Izuku and what might have happened to his eldritch parent, he let his guard down. Not entirely, but enough. Enough that he didn't hear something approach. Enough that he didn't notice Todoroki stop walking until he heard it. A low voice that sent shivers down his spine. Flesh. Katsuki whirled around to find the source of the voice. A tall person a man by the looks of it wearing a dark jumpsuit straight jacket with black restraints around his body and head, keeping his arms around his chest and his mouth pried open. Katsuki had expected to see villains. He expected to have to fight villains. What he didn't expect was some cannibalistic lunatic that made blades from his teeth. His teeth. Without thinking, he was already in a fighting position, getting ready to charge at the villain with explosive punches, until someone grabbed his shoulder. Bakugu. Icy Hot pulled him back as one of the villain's bladed teeth shot towards them, narrowly missing his leg. We aren't allowed to use our quirks to fight villains. Shut it, Icy Hot. Katsuki shouted as he dodged more blades. But as much as he didn't like to admit it, the bastard had a point. As much as he wanted to blast this creep into dust. They needed permission from their teacher to use their quirks. Fuck. Katsuki growled as he weighed his options while continuously dodging incoming attacks from the cannibalistic villain. Could he fight this guy without his quirk? Realistically, probably not and even if he could he would probably still get in trouble for fighting just like he would if he did use his quirk. But he couldn't just run. He was going to be the best. A better hero than All Might. He couldn't just run away when villains got too scary or too hard to beat. The villain began to get closer to them, trying desperately to cut them open with his teeth blades while screaming about pretty flesh. Gross. Then Katsuki noticed the fire. 
When did it get so close? It looked like it was trying to surround them and trap them in a ring of flames with this creep. Todoroki tried to use his ice on the flames in hopes of getting them to stop moving closer so they could think of a plan, but the fire was too hot. The ice was melting as soon as the fire touched it. He really didn't want to do this. He hated running, but he couldn't exactly be the best hero if he was dead. In a split-second decision, Katsuki grabs Todoroki by the shoulder to get his attention. Make an ice wall, then we'll make a run for it. The words felt bitter on his tongue. Just the thought of running left a bad taste in his mouth. But it was a bit late now. The other teen hurried to make a large wall of ice between them and their attacker before turning to follow his explosive classmate deeper into the forest. No, the villain screamed as he plunged his blades into the wall of ice, trying to break it down so he could follow his prey. The two teens didn't stop, and they only ran faster when they heard the wall of ice shatter behind them, followed by the screams of the crazy villain. Luckily they were faster than the villain. They ran as fast as they could without their quirks, only slowing down when they were sure they had lost their pursuer. As they slowed to halt, they took in deep breaths to steady themselves and hopefully calm down enough to keep moving. No way are they staying put if that lunatic was still nearby. Now that they have managed to get away from the bright fire, the forest seems a lot darker. It left the two teens feeling unsettled as they walked through the trees in darkness with only a small light, made by Todoroki's fire, to guide them. Neither of them spoke as they made their way through the forest. It was eerily quiet in the immediate area, the only sound being the screams in the distance. Katsuki hoped his friends were okay. As much as he liked to deny it, they were his friends. And even though he would probably never admit it, he was very worried about them. Katsuki heard a branch snap and he quickly turned in the direction of the noise, not willing to be snuck up on by a villain again. This time, however, instead of seeing a crazy villain, he saw the silhouettes of two people walking towards them. One, a girl by the looks of it, who wore a ponytail and something on her face. A mask. The other, a boy, muscular with spiky hair. Wait, Kirishima. Katsuki called trying his best to see the two people. Back you go. Todoroki, get out of here. There's some sort of gas. Katsuki didn't recognize the voice but he didn't need to as seconds later Kendo emerged from a purplish smoke he didn't realize was lingering in the air with Tetsu Tetsu unconscious and draped over her shoulder. Todoroki was quick to cover his mouth and nose from the gas, but Katsuki was already wobbling. Before he could realize what happened, everything went black and Katsuki fell unconscious. Muscular laughed at Izuku's claim, like laughing at a toddler when they try to act serious. I'm going to enjoy killing you. His murderous grin made the rage within Izuku boil as Koda clung to him tighter. Izuku grabbed Koda as he ducked away from one of Muscular's punches. He watched the man become bigger as more muscle covered his body and angrier as Izuku continued to dodge his attacks. I'm going to make you watch me kill that kid. He screamed between punches. Izuku still dodged. Then I'm going to kill you. Another punch. Another dodge. Then I'm going to kill the rest of them. Muscular growled loudly and screamed as his punch once again missed Izuku and Koda, crashing into the rocky floor. Koda, Izuku rolled behind a large rock, setting the boy down to look him in the eyes. I need you to close your eyes for me, okay? Why? That's stupid. I won't be able to see and get out of the way. Koda shouted back. Izuku felt a twisting feeling in his chest at the fear dripping from his voice and radiating off his presence. I know, I know, but I need you to trust me. Izuku looked at the child with what he knew was desperation in his eyes. I don't want you to see what I truly am. Koda stared for a second before thunderous stomping from Muscular's approach brought his attention back to the situation. Okay he hesitantly whispered and closed his eyes. Izuku held him tightly, dashing around Muscular as the villain smashes the rubble they were hiding behind. Within a second Izuku was out of sight, gently placing Koda down in a hiding place while Muscular searched for them. I won't let him hurt you, I promise, Izuku whispered. I trust you, came Koda's reply, his eyes still closed. If this were a different situation... Izuku would have been delighted to be trusted so much by someone who knew him so little, but right now all he could do was be thankful. The forest thing leapt out, standing behind Muscular with a glare that could kill. Just you and me now, asshole. Usually, he would hold back from swearing when children were in earshot. But he had spent enough time listening to Kota talk to know that such vocabulary wasn't necessary to avoid. There you are, Muscular growled. Playtime. The large villain lunged forward, ready to punch Izuku off the cliff with one hit. Izuku didn't falter or flinch, he simply stood his ground and glared at the villain who dared to threaten not one, but all of his kids. I'm not playing. Izuku's eyes flashed a toxic green as his bones cracked and skin ripped. His body contorted and reformed itself until what was once the small form of a skinny teenager, transformed into the same beast that ate Anamu when it dared attack his kids at the USJ. His eyes, now just bright green dots that sat inside the deer-like skull that was his head, flared green again as he growled at the villain. Muscular faltered slightly as he watched the tiny teenager change into a nightmare monster that was taller than himself. The sight would be enough to make some grown men turn tail and run away. 
It was truly terrifying. But he wasn't a coward. He would still kill whatever this thing was. He threw another punch, putting more force into it this time. When Izuku had first showed up he had underestimated him and hadn't used enough power in his punch. Not a mistake he'll repeat. The forest thing let out a short roar as he took the full force of the super-powered punch, but he doesn't go down. He grabs muscular by his shoulder, digging into the muscle fibers with his long, sharp claws and tearing them apart. Muscular cries out in pain as the forest thing mercilessly rips at his arm. He pulls his other arm back for punch and aims for the head, trying to get the monster to let him go. Izuku clings to the man's arm, digging his claws in deeper and ripping harder. He managed to hold on after the blow to the head but it's a blow to his body that sends him away from the villain. The villain lets out another pained scream as the claws are ripped from his shoulder and his arm almost goes with it. He staggers backward, clutching his shoulder with his uninjured arm. He can feel it, his arm barely hanging onto his body, barely able to be useful even after using his quirk to cover it. That thing almost ripped his arm off. Izuku didn't stop there. He couldn't. This man had to go. This time it was the forest thing who lunged forward, but instead of going in for a punch, Izuku grabbed Muscular's leg and pulled it out from under him, causing the man to fall onto his back with a heavy crash. Izuku was quick to tear into his leg with his claws. He just hoped Kota listened to him. He didn't want a child to see this. He didn't want Kota to see him do this. Once again Muscular screamed as Izuku clawed at him. He started kicking frantically to get the beast off him, but only succeeded in getting dragged further into the forest thing's grasp. Izuku pulled his claws away from the man's leg, crawling forward until the two of them were eye to eye and pinning him down by the shoulders with his bloody claws. Muscular glared at him, a useless attempt at being intimidating while pinned to the ground of a rocky cliff. Izuku took a deep breath then let out a loud scream or roar, right in the man's face, earning a wince from the villain, before gripping him with his claws and throwing him off the cliff. The forest thing waited for a moment. He waited to see if Muscular would get back up. He knew he probably wouldn't, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Izuku, Koda's small voice broke through the silence and Izuku turned to face him. As he looked at the child in front of him, staring with wide eyes at his true form, his chest became tight and what sounded like a heart started to pound within his chest. He didn't want Koda to see him like this. Slowly, Izuku shrunk back down to his more human-like form, kneeling on the ground with Viridian hair falling in front of his eyes. I told you to close your eyes Izuku manages to say, not able to meet Koda's eyes just yet. He hears small steps approach him. Then he sees small red shoes in front of him. He looks up, just in time to catch Kota as the boy jumps into his arms for a tight hug. You're my hero. It didn't take long for the forest to be set ablaze and for the students to be scattered amongst the trees. Five minutes, actually. Within five minutes Shouta had gone from teaching the students who had failed their exams to running outside after hearing some sort of commotion, only to be attacked by a villain covered in scars. The fight didn't last long, though. Shouta was able to take him down quick enough. Too quick in his opinion. It was suspicious. It was like the villain wasn't fighting as hard as he could have been. Like he didn't need to because Shouta wasn't actually a threat, which wasn't the case. What made matters even more confusing was when the villain melted right in front of him, he turned into some grey sludge and became nothing but a puddle on the ground. Shouta knew it wasn't his quirk since the villain had been using fire against him. No doubt he was the villain who lit up the forest, so logically he knew there had to be others helping. But why were they even here? A racer had. Shouta looked towards the trees to see the humanoid version of UAS cryptid running towards him, faster than a normal human should be able to move, with Kota clutched to his chest. Villains found the camp. Izuku skid to a stop in front of him, already handing Kota over to him. Take Kota somewhere safe while I help everyone else. As soon as the child was in his arms, the forest thing was turning to run back into the forest, leaving no room for Shouta to protest anything he had said. Izuku, Shouta grabbed him by the wrist with his capture scarf. Get Mandalay to tell the students that they can use their quirks to protect themselves. Izuku nodded to him before transforming into his dog form and running into the trees. Faster. Need to go faster. Need to protect them. Izuku weaved through the trees as fast as he could. He had defeated Muscular, given Kota to Aizawa, gotten Mandalay to relay Aizawa's message to the students. Now he has to find them. Whether them means the students or the villains, he doesn't know. He just needs to find someone. He just needs to help. Izuku knew that he would always be able to protect them. They were going to be heroes, after all, it's not a very safe job. But they were still students, still children. Even if they could fight and take care of themselves, helping them was his biggest priority. Izuku jumped through a wall of blue fire, the flames singeing his fur, though he barely felt it. Fear and distress from others surrounded him in almost every direction. Not yet enough to overwhelm him as it had back in Hasu, but enough to make him push himself to go faster and be stronger, a feeling he could only assume was what it felt like when humans got an adrenaline rush. Izuku reached out to his senses. Everyone's fear blended together and it was hard to make out a single person. 
But if he could find someone who felt familiar he would be able to find them, instead of running aimlessly through the woods. He reached further, pushing his senses to find someone, anyone, within the cloud of emotion that was the forest camp, and he found it. Two people close enough to break through the hazy fog. They were close, but he couldn't hear them yet. He couldn't tell who it was either. The forest thing followed his senses towards the two people who seemed to be jumping and running around a small area, probably fighting, but not each other, which meant there was most likely a third person. His other senses were obscured by everything around him so he wasn't able to rely on those very well at the moment. There was too much noise coming from every direction to hear specific things. Too much smoke from the fire to sniff anyone out, and licking things wouldn't do much. So Izuku just had to hope his sight emotion sense would be enough. As the forest thing got closer to the fight he began to hear voices. He couldn't exactly make out what they were saying. But he could tell all three of them were female and one of them sounded like Tsu, which meant Achako was probably there as well. Izuku slowed to a crawl as he approached, staying low in the bushes and watching through the leaves. Sure enough, on the path was Achako fighting a blonde girl in a school uniform. Though despite the uniform Izuku knew she was a villain, while Tsu was pinned to a tree by her hair, ouch. He watched as Achako threw the girl to the dirt, pinning her down. Usually, Izuku would be proud, but there were more important things to do right now so he'd have to do that later. The villain kicked Achako off her, pinning her to the ground instead and jabbing some sort of needle into her thigh. Izuku had seen enough. He growled and leapt out of the bushes, using his body to knock the girl off his kit. She stood and glares at him stupid dog. You are so not cute. The blonde villain ran at him, knife in hand and ready to stab. Unfortunately for her, Izuku was faster. The forest thing ran forward, quickly closing the gap between him and the villain before using his head to hit her in the shins, knocking her down again. I'm out of here. The girl glared and pouted as she ran into the forest. At least it was easier than fighting muscular. Izuku turned his attention to the two students as Achako helped Tsu down from where she was hanging by her ponytail. Are you okay, Tsu? Achako asked quickly as she helped her friend. Yeah, I'm fine. Tsu rubbed at her scalp. No doubt it was sore from holding all her weight. The girls held hands as they walked over to Izuku, petting his head and giving him their thanks. You should come with us, Izuku. We're going to find the others. Achako gestured for him to follow as they walked down the path. Bakugo said you're good at finding people. Izuku walked in front of the girls as they made their way down the forest path. The pace was slower than he would have liked, but at least they were walking fast. He couldn't expect them to go as fast as he could when he ran. As the three walked, Izuku stayed on the lookout for other people but came to the same problem he had before. All of the emotions blended together making an indecipherable cloud of emotion that prevented him from finding the locations of the students. That is until someone came close enough to break through the fog, someone who was running right for them, feet hitting heavy against the ground as the tall person barreled towards them. Izuku stopped walking, crouching lower and getting ready to fight if he needed to. He couldn't tell who the person was, he just knew that they were big. Su and Achako noticed Izuku's aggressive stance and stopped walking as well. Both of them got ready to fight, standing back to back to get a better view of the area as they watched for whatever Izuku was snarling at. Then the large person ran out of the trees, stumbling to a halt on the path in front of them. They looked like they were carrying something on their back. Su, Yuraka. The girls quickly turned to look at the person as Izuku dropped his aggression, running over to them without hesitation. Shoji, they exclaimed as they followed the forest thing over to their friend and classmate. But you two are okay. Achako asked. Yes, Shoji responded as the group continued to walk through the forest. Dark Shadow somehow knocked Takoyami unconscious but I think he'll be fine. Izuku felt pride full his chest as Shoji told them how he had helped to calm Dark Shadow then carried Fumikage through the villain-infested forest to keep him safe. He was so proud of his kids. But once again he'll have to wait until everyone is safe to tell them how proud he is and how proud they should be of themselves. Right now he has to focus. No more distractions. Izuku led the group down the forest path, headed back towards the building where Aizawa, Vlad, and hopefully the rest of the students are. The forest thing just hoped that the students who were already there had enough common sense to stay put. He didn't want more of his kids to possibly get hurt. As they got closer to the clearing where the pussycats had been fighting Izuku started to hear more voices and his ears started to twitch. Some voices were more familiar than others. He could hear some of his kids from 1A and he could hear some from 1B, but some voices were less familiar. A few he could tell were the pussycats and another sounded like that girl he had found attacking Achako and Sue. Izuku entered the forest clearing first and immediately saw students and the pussycats, all of them fighting for their lives against the villains that had invaded their camp. He started to count the students, listing off who was missing and who he knew was, or should be, at the building with the teachers, but was cut off when a wall of blue flames separated him from the group he had been leading through the trees. Izuku turned to his right and met cyan eyes that held the same cyan fire within them, eyes he was sure he had seen before. Where has he seen those eyes? It couldn't be anyone the Bakugus knew. 
and it wasn't anyone he had met in his past. He hears Achako call out to him as the fire grows hotter and almost burns her. The forest thing stares at the villain and the villain stares back, ready to make another attack on the students but not breaking eye contact with their eldritch protector. The staring felt as familiar as his eyes looked and Izuku began to get frustrated for not remembering. How could he not remember? The answer felt so close and yet so far away. The man's scarred face stretched into a wide, sadistic smile that pulled at the staples holding his flesh together. Izuku growled as the fire made by the villain separated him further from his kit. The forest thing stared at the villain and his eyes that looked so familiar and the smile that almost dared to bring a memory to his mind. A person who Izuku knew nothing and too much about and yet he still couldn't figure out who it was who stood in front of him, threatening to burn his kids to a crisp. His kids needed him. He couldn't be distracted by who this villain could be or who he reminds him of. He needs to protect Su and Achako and Mizo. He needs to find Katsuki and Hitoshi and Shouto and... And that was, wasn't it? Suddenly it hit him like a brick and there was no mistaking it. And there was no more distraction. Izuku growled low and jumped high. He went directly through the blue inferno that was separating him from his kids and the villain. As he jumped and his body left the ground, his limbs cracked and stretched and his scruffy fur faded into pale skin covered by ragged clothes. His snout turned into a face with perfectly placed freckles and his paws turned to hands with sharp, dark claws at the tips. But his eyes held the same toxic green rage that had been fueling him all night. The students watched as their beloved class mascot lunged at the flame villain without hesitation and as his dog-like appearance changed to that of a teenager. Izuku tackled the villain to the ground, pinning him down by the shoulders just as he did to muscular. Green eyes met Cyan with a glare that could have killed and a snarl that showed his mouth full of sharp fangs. Todoroki, Izuku accused, and with the shocked expression that immediately fell on the villain's face, there was no mistaking it. Now that he was close, the forest thing could smell it and he remembered smelling something similar at the sports festival. Could this be the same person he found sitting in the audience? The look of shock was quickly replaced by anger as the villain tried to use his fire to get rid of the forest thing. It was hot, yes, probably the hottest fire Izuku has ever seen. But it's not something that can kill a forest thing. Izuku pulled his right arm back, ready to strike him. He wasn't going to hesitate just because he's a Todoroki. Not when he tried to hurt his kids. He was about to bring his claws down when a voice pulled his attention away from his fight. They have Shinzo. In those blue marble things. Izuku didn't see who had spoken but he knew it was one of the students. The villain under him chuckled darkly and threw Izuku off while he was distracted. The scarred villain stood quickly and approached a purple portal that began opening in the middle of the forest clearing. The forest thing jumped to his feet and saw the villains gathering around the portal. One of them wearing a hat and a long, yellow coat. In his hand was a small, blue orb. Izuku lunged forward again as the scarred villain produced more flames to keep the students away from the villain who had taken Hitoshi. He swiped at the villain and tried to grab the marble. But he dodged and Izuku tumbled to the ground. Not many people can dodge Izuku, he knew that. Either he was getting slower, or this villain was very fast. Izuku, though Chako called. He turned to see her press the pads of her fingers together, letting rocks rain down on the villains like a mini-meteor shower. Once again the villain dodged but the rock rain was the perfect distraction as Mizo threw a larger rock right at the villain, causing him to let go of the marble. Izuku leapt up once again but this time he grabbed the marble out of the air before the villains could retrieve it. He landed in a roll and growled at the villains. Bring him back. The villain in the yellow coat chuckled as he stepped closer to the purple portal. As you wish. The small orb in his hands glowed for a second and then turned into another rock. Izuku was almost blinded by rage. How dare they come here and threaten the lives of his kids? How dare they hurt these children? How dare they try to kidnap someone Izuku loves? It will be their last mistake. You bastards. Izuku yelled as he dropped the rock. Where is he? You mean this? The scarred villain stood in front of a dark portal as a blue orb in his hand glowed and out came Hitoshi, looking shocked and confused. The villain smirked as he gripped Hitoshi by his neck and stepped back into the portal. You lose, heroes. Hitoshi. Izuku ran forward, arms outstretched to grab his kid. He watched as his scared expression got engulfed by the dark portal and in an instant, all the villains were gone, along with Hitoshi. The forest thing slid across the dirt on his knees as he landed and everything went silent as time seemed to stand still. Everyone in the clearing was shocked. Their classmate and friend had just been kidnapped and they had just watched the creature they had called Dog for so long transform into a human who looked like he was around their age. Izuku stared at the ground with wide eyes as he gripped the dirt with hands that were outstretched to save one of his kids, hands that only held dirt. Despite his enhanced hearing, everything was silent, until he heard a tired voice. Izuku, Shouto panted as he emerged from the forest with Katsuki unconscious and slung over his shoulder and Kendo following behind him with Tetsu Tetsu in a similar position. Within a second Izuku was on his feet as running to their side, catching Katsuki as Shouto gave in to his exhaustion. Achako and Tsu ran over to help Kendo with Tetsu Tetsu. 
Izuku held both boys and lowered them to the ground slowly. Shouto slumped down next to him as he pulled a gas mask off his face, most likely made by Momo, and brushed sweaty red and white hair away from his eyes. There was gas, Shouto spoke softly. He's okay, just unconscious. Thank you, Shouto. Izuku held both of them tightly as they slumped against him, though Shouto was still awake. You did good. All of you did so good. I'm so proud of you all. The other students came to sit around them, everyone staying close to each other. They didn't know if the villains would come back. Izuku assumed they wouldn't. But for the first time since the sunset, everything was quiet. The fire disappeared and so did the gas. And slowly the rest of the students emerged from the trees just like Shouto and Kendo did. They all sat together, feeling safety in each other's presence. But despite the silence in the forest around them, Izuku couldn't quiet his mind. All he could think about relaxing now, he had to keep going. Get the hurt students to a healer or a hospital. Find the teacher and regroup. Find Hitoshi and save him from the villains who dared to kidnap him. There are the students. Hey listeners. Izuku and all the students huddled around him turned to see present Mike, along with Aizawa, All Might, and the rest of the pro heroes from UA. A little late, but Izuku was just glad they came at all. Once the students got to a safe place he could assist the pros in saving Hitoshi, if they even let him help. He'll make sure Hitoshi and the rest of the kids are safe, no matter what. The heroes had come. Nedzu, along with the rest of the UA pro hero staff had arrived with police and paramedics not far behind. Those with the paramedics jumped into action immediately. As soon as the ambulance came to a stop, they began to treat the injured students while heroes went into the forest to search for the students who were still missing and find any villains that might have been left behind. The principal gave Izuku a quick glance. His gaze didn't linger and his expression didn't hold any specific emotion. But the forest thing could tell he was studying each student that sat around Izuku, who was still in human form. Maybe he was wondering why Izuku was choosing to be in his human form in front of all the students. But the forest thing assumed it wouldn't be too hard for the principal to figure out he just couldn't fight that many people as a dog, especially a villain like Muscular. Soon, all the students were found and the remaining villains were taken into police custody no doubt on their way to Tartarus prison. The students of classes 1A and 1B who didn't need to go to the hospital for further medical care were escorted by pro heroes back to UA campus where a detective could question them. Izuku didn't go back to UA. Instead, he accompanied Katsuki and others to the hospital. The staff at the hospital were hesitant about letting him stay in Katsuki's room while he was recovering. But after Aizawa, who was there getting his own wounds treated, talked to some of the nurses, they let him stay. Safe to say it was one of the longest nights Izuku had in a very long time. Even after the villains left and everyone got to safety, the hours he spent waiting by Katsuki's bed felt like an eternity. He knew he should be with the heroes, helping them find the villains and get Hitoshi back. But no matter how many times he told himself to get up and go help, he just couldn't. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't leave Katsuki. Izuku had seen this kid grow up. He saw almost every stage of his life so far. He saw every mistake and success, every good decision and bad, every smile and every tear since he was six years old. Izuku knew the blonde would want him to help the teachers get his classmate back safely, but Izuku just couldn't leave. After the sun had risen it was almost a full day before Nedzu entered the room where Izuku was watching over the unconscious teen, which meant it had been almost 24 hours since Hitoshi had been kidnapped. Izuku's chest tightened with the feeling of guilt, thinking about what might be happening to the lavender boy. The rat creature approached slowly, keeping his eyes on Izuku's humanoid form. He had changed back to a dog briefly when Katsuki's parents had visited but had changed back after. I apologize for the interruption, Izuku, the principal said quietly, stopping a few feet away from the bed the usually loud and explosive teen was sleeping on. But it seems like All Might is going to need your assistance. Izuku pried his eyes away from Katsuki's sleeping form and turned to the principal with a dark expression. How can I help? Shouta crouched on a roof near the battle, somewhere he wouldn't be seen. The plan was simple, really. It was obvious that All Might wasn't as strong as he used to be, and it was likely All for One also knew this and would use it to his advantage. They sent All Might in any way. The blonde oaf was meant to keep most of All for One's attention on him while other pros try to overwhelm him and take him down. It wasn't a very good plan, in Shouta's opinion, but nobody had any better ones. While all this was happening, a smaller team had been sent to a different location to rescue Shinzo who was being held in an old bar that looked abandoned. They had managed to grab Shinzo a few minutes after All Might began his fight with All for One, but the villains who were at the bar were able to escape through a portal. Shouta adjusted the yellow goggles over his eyes as he watched the fight below him. There wasn't much he could do in a fight like this and as much as it pissed him off, he was specifically told by Nedzu to keep watch. The rat had been cryptic as always, telling him he would know when his quirk was needed. The only thing that pissed Shouta off more than being useless in a fight 
was when people were purposefully vague and cryptic, something his boss did almost constantly. Rubble was flying everywhere and dust lingered in the air as the two superhumans exchanged punches with each other. Things weren't looking good. All Might was starting to deflate and All for One wasn't slowing down at all, despite all the hits he was taking. Shouta had known from the beginning that the odds weren't in their favor, but he never would have imagined things going this poorly. All for One started monologuing. He couldn't hear what the villain was saying, but he could tell he was saying something as he stood over All Might's thin form below him. Shouta watched. He waited, patiently, and that's when it happened. The biggest hawk Shouta had ever seen swooped in, latching onto and digging its sharp talons into All for One's bald head. Leave it to Nedzu to change the plan in the middle of the plan. All for One grabbed the bird, throwing it to the ground hard enough to make Shouta almost flinch. The bird's form changed as it skids across the ground after being thrown by the supervillain, the feathery head of an oversized hawk being replaced by a bush of green curls that Shouta immediately recognized. Shouta activated his quirk, red eyes focusing on the villain as he began to fight the green-haired cryptid. All for One didn't have eyes, but he was definitely glaring at Izuku now. Shouta's focus didn't waver. He didn't see what Izuku had done at the USJ. He was unfortunate enough to pass out after being repeatedly slammed into the pavement by the Namo. Shouta didn't see what he had done at the forest camp. All he knows about Izuku fighting is from the retelling of the events. He knows the forest thing can shapeshift but has never seen him as anything other than a dog, a human, and now a hawk. Other than that, Shouta doesn't know what to expect from this fight. The pro hero got closer by a few rooftops never taking his eyes off the two and going unseen by the supervillain as all of his attention was on the small form of Izuku who was crouched in front of him. The other pros took this as an opportunity to get All Might off the battlefield and away from the fight that was about to ensue. Izuku's toxic green eyes began to glow bright, but that was mostly the only detail Shouta could see from the distance he was at. A screech followed the glowing eyes, so loud they barely registered his words and almost enough to make Shouta blink. You hurt my kids. It barely sounded human. Shrill and full of rage, the volume of the scream echoed around the destroyed city, causing a few of the pros to cover their ears from the sound. For a second, a brief, fleeting moment, Shouta saw the fear of God strike through all for one's expression. And why wouldn't it when following the piercing scream, the small, thin form of Izuku, who had a cute face dotted with freckles and a mess of curly green hair, transformed into something Shouta could only describe as nightmarish. He wasn't a man who scared easily, but this was something else. It looked like a creature from pre-quirk folklore. Spiked antlers atop the moss-covered skull of a deer with glowing green dots in the eye socket. Sharp claws and inhumanly long arms attached to a thin body that looked like it was barely more than bones. Shouta had to fight off a shiver at the sight of the true forest thing. The creature that had been pretending to be a dog and following his students around all year. Not including however long he's been with Bakugu. Izuku was the one to make the first move, swiping at the villain with his large claw and leaving a long wound across his front. With Shouta's quirk focused on him, all for one was faltering, but not falling. With all the quirks he possessed, it was difficult to erase them all, or even find his original quirk to erase. A massive, quirk-enhanced fist flew at Izuku, hitting him in the chest and pushing him back into a pile of rubble. The forest thing didn't stay down for long, though. Within seconds he was back in front all for one, throwing hit after hit, ripping his flesh apart faster than the man's healing quirks could fix him, thanks to erasure. All for one stumbled back, blood pouring from multiple wounds across his body and a large hand reaching out in an attempt to shove the eldritch horror away from him. The hit sent Izuku stumbling as well. He crashed into the rubble and Shouta could have sworn he saw multiple bones break before they snapped back together seconds later like some god-forsaken action figure reject. The supervillain picked up a large piece of rubble with his massive, quirk-enhanced hand, throwing it at Izuku and hitting the forest thing hard in the side. This time Shouta was sure he saw his ribs cave in under the chunk of building that he was hit with. The forest thing let out another screech as he pushed the rubble off and his ribs snapped back into place. He had been hit hard, but unfortunately for all for one, it wasn't enough to stop the forest thing. Izuku ran forward and tackled the man, who in his weakened state wasn't able to push the creature off. He was growing desperate and his quirks were starting to fail him. All for one kicked at its thin body, hearing the cracking of bones under the force of his foot, but still unable to get free. He hit the forest thing's skull again and again with a fist covered by scraps of metal, but it still didn't stop. Shouta watched as Izuku grabbed the villain's bald head in his claws, just like he had at the beginning of the fight, and began to squeeze. The hero knew this is what the fight would come to once Izuku joined. He knew once the forest thing got his claws on all for one that it was death or nothing. Knowing Nedzu, the rat had also come to this conclusion. Shouta had been a hero for over a decade, but watching someone die, especially a bloody death like this, even if it is the worst villain the world had ever seen, seeing someone die never got easier. Izuku roared loud. The sound was a deep rumble and was in stark contrast with the screech he had released earlier. 
All for one grabbed at the forest thing's long arms and screamed in agony as the grip on his head only tightened, and tightened, and tightened. Then there was a crack. Then there was silence. Then there was nothing. Izuku doesn't move. He stands, looking at all for one's dead body. Blood drips from his claws, and for a moment, everything is quiet. Soon he hears distant voices and he barely registers them calling his name. The quiet didn't last very long. The forest thing ignored the voices, he could barely hear them anyway. Instead, he shrunk down to his humanoid form and took a breath to calm his nerves before looking around with a new determination in his eyes. Izuku needed to find Hitoshi. He started moving without a second thought, walking past the pro heroes who had been calling his name, not even sparing them a glance as he passed. They called to him again. Izuku recognized one of the voices as present Mike but paid the man no mind. Izuku walked off the battlefield, onto streets that, while still covered with rubble, were considerably more clear than where the actual battle had taken place. He passed an ambulance where All Might was being cared for, only looking for a moment to make sure the hero wasn't too hurt. Izuku kept walking, slowly picking up speed until he was running through the city streets as fast as he could without the boost of being in a forest. Soon he arrived outside the bar where the League had been hiding and a familiar head of purple hair came into view. The forest thing ran over to the team like a dog excited to see its owner after they returned home. Which, ironically, was a situation Izuku was quite familiar with. His arms wrapped around Hitoshi as soon as he was close enough. The teen would have fallen over from the force of Izuku running into him had the forest thing not been holding him. Hitoshi stumbled slightly and tensed up at the contact. Hitoshi, I was so worried about you. Izuku looked up at the taller, green eyes meeting purple. Faint recognition flashed through Hitoshi's eyes as he looked at the forest thing. Izuku, he mumbled. The forest thing perked up at his name, nodding quickly. Are you hurt? Did they hurt you? If they did, I'll track them down. I promise, nobody hurts my kids. Izuku rambled. The tension in Hitoshi's shoulders fell. His arms wrapped around Izuku and his head lowered to rest on his shoulder, purple hair tickling Izuku's nose. The forest thing cut off his rambling and hugged Hitoshi closer. You're okay now. I'll keep you safe, I promise. It had been a day since the fight. Hitoshi didn't need much medical attention so he left the hospital this morning. Thankfully, before everything went to shit, Nedzu was able to get Hitoshi out of his bad foster home, along with any other foster kids that were being mistreated and put into emergency foster care with a good home. Izuku was quite happy when he found out Hitoshi would be going with Aizawa. He deserved someone who would take care of him and Izuku knew Aizawa would do his best, even if it was temporary. With all for one taken care of, though some weren't happy with Izuku's methods of taking care of him, Everything was slowly going back to normal, or as normal as their lives could be. Most of the students and the heroes were out of the hospital. Repairs were being made to damaged areas of the city, and classes at UA would be starting again soon. Nedzu was even having dorms made for the students. Those who were at the Kamino Ward fight were enjoying their victory, especially All Might, who had watched All for One kill his mentor when he was young and had been trying to bring him down since. But Izuku couldn't celebrate. Katsuki still hadn't woken up. The doctors assured Izuku that he was fine. That everyone heals differently and some take longer than others, but he couldn't help but worry. Once Aizawa came to get Itoshi, Izuku had gone back to Katsuki's room and sat in the same chair he had been sitting in before Nedzu had asked for his help. Izuku sighed. He wished he was able to help his kid somehow. Wished he could have stopped him from getting hurt. Or maybe he could have prevented the attack on the camp altogether, then none of his kids would have been hurt. But even a forest thing has its limits. Even with all his power, he isn't able to protect everyone all the time, even if he wished he could. He couldn't, it wasn't possible. A shuffle and a groan stopped Izuku from spiraling further and pulled him out of his thoughts. He looked at the blonde laying on the hospital bed and found red eyes staring at him. What the fuck happened? Katsuki asked, his voice strained from not being used for days. Without noticing, Izuku grabbed Katsuki's hand, holding it tightly. The camp was attacked by the League. One of the villains knocked you out with some sort of gas he spoke quietly. The teen grunted as he looked around the hospital room. His eyes landed on a clock on the table next to him that read, 1.34 p.m. Katsuki's eyes snapped back to Izuku. How long have I been asleep? Izuku thought for a moment. He had lost track of time from the attack on the camp until now and waiting for Katsuki to wake up definitely felt longer than it probably was. I think about three days. He sounded somewhat unsure, but the answer sounded right. For a moment both of them were silent. Izuku looked down at his lap and Katsuki stared at the forest thing with sharp eyes. You don't need to be worried, you know. I can take care of myself. Katsuki crossed his arms, almost pouting. Izuku lifted his head to look at him. He knew Katsuki was only saying this to make himself feel less vulnerable or weak. He had been this way since Izuku had met him. The teen's grumpiness strangely comforted the forest thing. It meant he was awake. He was still here. 
Izuku leaned forward, wrapping Katsuki in an almost suffocating hug and he couldn't help the tears that came to his eyes. I thought you wouldn't wake up, Izuku cried. At that moment, Katsuki's tough guy act broke. He hugged Izuku tightly while trying to hold back his own tears. He had known Izuku for ten years yet he had only ever seen the forest thing cry one other time. It was while they were watching a sad movie. Katsuki didn't comment on it at the time, mostly to hide the fact that the movie had him close to tears as well. But this was way different. These weren't tears caused by some stupid film. Izuku was so worried that he had broken down with emotion when he found out Katsuki was okay. It was nice to know the forest thing cared about him so much, but it also made him feel guilty for the pain he caused. Quit crying on me. You'll fill this tiny ass room with your tears and we'll both drown. Katsuki complained but didn't pull away from the hug. Izuku gave a wet laugh as he slowly let go of his kid and sat in his chair again, wiping tears off his freckled cheeks with his hand. I'm just glad you're okay. Yeah, yeah. Katsuki looked down at the blanket that covered his legs. I'm glad you're okay, too. The forest thing smiled softly. He considered himself lucky for finding Katsuki that day in the forest. He always said it was the best thing to happen to him and even though Katsuki would complain about Izuku being annoying, he couldn't imagine what life would be like if he hadn't found Izuku. Izuku opened his mouth to say something when the door to the room flew open and in walked Katsuki's parents. They froze and stared when they noticed Izuku sitting by their son's bedside. Normal this wouldn't be a problem. But considering Izuku was in human form right now, it was a bit of a problem. Brat, who the hell is this? Mitsuki asked, voice loud as usual. Green eyes once again met red eyes and the two looked silently panicked for a moment. Well, Mitsuki pushed, her voice getting louder. The two turned to look at the blonde woman and spoke at the same time. We can explain. 